it's a spiritual war and that in each particular phase or the moment of the evolution of war, the capacities that individuals and groups, communities have to learn to be able to prosecute that war properly, to emerge uh -huh. victorious, change. Like people became aware of, okay, what makes me afraid? And how does my fear make it easy for me to be led and manipulated? What does it look like when somebody who I trusted is telling me falsehood? How do I actually begin to notice that things like credentials aren't actually a functional proxy for <laughs> competence or good faith? How do I navigate a world where I can't trust any institutions? You can fall into the trap of trying to locate empire within people. And instead of it being like Ragnarok, like the war of the gods, the war of ideas, the war of stories, where it's not somebody you shoot with a gun. It's not somebody you punch with a fist. It's yep. not somebody you yell at and abuse on Instagram. They may be participating in this ideology of empire. And so there may be some contention between your story and their story. But don't forget, like, these are all our people. The term I used was infinitesimal courage. To mm -hmm. distinguish it against the coarse grain courage, which is a very noble thing, but the ability of those young men to charge the beaches at Normandy, that's coarse grain courage. We've been doing that for a long time. But the infinitesimal courage that goes all the way to the interior and allows, forces you to make the proper choices even though nobody's looking and nobody will know the difference, that's a different kind of thing. How are we going to navigate out of this mess that we're currently in and navigating towards into a more beautiful world? Jordan Hall is on this show and he's one of the most profound, deepest thinkers, probably has the most extensive vocabulary of anyone I've also had on the show. So even if you don't understand some of these words, you'll be able to feel the truth of the messaging and the conversations we're having that really take a look at reality, what is real, and also the possibility of possibility of where we could end up into a more beautiful world. So this is one of my favorite shows, and I can't wait to share it with you with Jordan Hall. Jordan, good to have you here, man. Thank you. All right, I want you to fast forward 10 years into a future where somebody is, let's say they're from another planet or they're from another place where they haven't been tracking things that have been going on. And they're asking you this question. And they say, wow, it was a close shave. <laughs> there were some close calls. There were some tricky moments. But you guys all pulled through. How did you do it? How did you do it? Um, by far the most important piece was humility. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed in myself um, and in all the relationships that I've been in is that we have everything we need. And we have a lot of wisdom. We meaning humanity. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people who've been working on a lot of stuff for a long time. Like it's crazy when you go out there and actually look at how you find some pocket of people, uh, you know, 65 year old folks who've been working on something in Maui right. for 40 years. Right. They got some stuff. It's not perfect, but it's interesting. We got a lot. But boy, we have a hard time working together. That's what holds us back. So, what was, what changed? How did people start working together? What was this? And, and, and how does humility? play that role like what is how does that how did that actually how did why did you name that as the first thing mm. well, let's see in you know, the sense of humility and that word humiliation which is important to kind of honor right because we have a bad feeling we don't want to be humiliated uh -huh. but if we recognize that humiliation connects to humility in a very deep way uh -huh. which is to be brought low to be brought out of a, a sense of our own self-importance and to be brought into a relationship with the reality that we are only part of something bigger than ourselves. Right? So that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Once you really hold that, right now I'm kind of feeling the AA um, moment, right? The moment where it's like, wow, I cannot solve this problem. I am, this is beyond my capacity. I have to have a relationship of humility to something which is larger than myself, surrender to that, and then allow that to guide me in my choices. And let's use that model, the community. Right. Like, I don't think AA works without absolutely the AA community. You yeah. got somebody who's your big brother. You got somebody who's helping guide you. You got a whole crew that's helping support you in your mission. Yeah. And take that almost fractally up. Um, the word community is something that we have a hard time with because we don't really have any in our world. We have assemblages of people, we have groups of affinity, we have people who live near each other. 
with people who hang out in different ways in different contexts. But that notion of really communal, that notion of the people who will be at your, at your funeral, mm -hmm. or you'll be at theirs, and you'll maybe take care of their family when they're gone. Like that's the thing we don't really have much of. Well, how do you compose that? Oddly enough, here's another one people don't like, suffering. Hmm. And think about AA, right? Your sponsor, your big brother, they've suffered, meaning they've gone through, right? The word suffer, to undergo. Doesn't mean to have shitty experiences, although I suppose in some sense it does, but you know, no pain, no gain. It's uh, the characteristic of having actually truly and fully undergone real experience, like rich, rough, and have grown as a result and come together on the other side in a new higher wholesomeness, a new higher, higher whole. That gives, gives them the capacity simultaneously to actually empathize with you mm -hmm. and right? not just feel bad for you, but to really say, yeah, I know that a little bit about what it is you're going through. And I know that I don't understand it. And I know enough to know that there's something akin. And I can tell you that I went through something that I'm on the other side of. So there's hope that you can get through. Yeah. That creates a sense of real connection and a sense of community because it's deeper. Right? It's deeper than our individual wants and desires and preferences. You've gone to a deep, dark place. You've gone to that place of grief and that grace of that place of, of brokenness that takes you past all the nonsense of the ego and all the characteristics of all the stories that we like to pretend that we're playing into, a, into reality. Can you really trust somebody, yourself personally, just asking Aubrey to Jordan, and do you really trust somebody who hasn't been to a deep, dark place, who hasn't Negative. really suffered? <laughs> you no, you cannot. It's no. interesting, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, this is beautiful. You're living in, you know, I know this is a model we're all familiar with. We're, we're, you're living in the pre-tragic, baby. Like you're living <laughs> in this pre-tragic state where right. it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's not my job to shake you out of it necessarily. However, mm. there is some kind of impulse to like, all right, hey, y'all, you know, like the pre-tragic's awesome, but also we got to look at the tragic, which is the complexity and confusion of the world we're in. And then we got to include and transcend that into the post-tragic where we return to that same innocence that you're feeling now. So don't worry, you're still going to get back there, but you're going to have to embrace a larger field mm -hmm. of challenges, existential threats, issues that are facing us that you just can't ignore anymore. And we can't ignore this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And to become the one who can and has embraced, right? Just to kind of like put the, the, the dot on it. It's not a, uh, it's not a mental or intellectual exercise. Right? It's an existential process of becoming. Mm -hmm. And right? uh, that process of going through the pre tragic to the post tragic is a shattering and a breaking open and a, and a recognition of the fact that you weren't in control in the first place. And so you just have to be with what's happening. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then you become one who can be in the world in that way, right? That's the post-tragic. Like, yeah, you're right. I wasn't in control in the first place, and that's all right. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a crucial thing. So for me in my life, I've started to organize my community around the intentional, the intentional access of the deep places and the dark places and the suffering places and the places where you have to come together. So a huge part of my life is going through initiatory practices, which mm -hmm. is another mm -hmm. community slash tribe technology that we've lost, but it's still there, mm -hmm. you know? And so when you go through like deep ayahuasca journeys with your, with your brothers and sisters, you're not going to have the same experience, but you know that you've touched something that's deep mm -hmm. and touched something that's challenging. And then even though the content of their journey isn't the same as yours, like you can hug them at the end and go like, I know. Like, I know, I know what that was or a sweat lodge or, you know, I climbed a frozen mountain with Wim Hof and a band of brothers and yeah. like you finish that thing and there's a bond that's created and a trust that's created. Like what happens at the top of that icy mountain in Mount Schnitzka when your fucking ice spikes fall off your shoes and you're sliding down the mountain and you got your brother who down hikes because you slid down 50, you know, 50 feet and there cold as hell and we had our shirts off because of course it's Wim Hof and <laughs> you know they're down there with the biting freezing sleet hitting them and they're going they're sitting down with you as you have to take off your gloves and put your spikes back on and you know to me that that guy was humble the poet he was he was out there and he's not the strongest climber of our whole mm. group but he saw he saw what happened and he grabbed it and he down climbed and he got me and he sat down there with me and he put that on and I'll never forget that moment it's like oh no bro I trust you like if shit gets bad and I'm hurt and I need help, you know, like you got me. 
Yeah, the well, notion of initiation that would have just come to me is something I've been uh, thinking about only for the past couple of weeks or so. Uh, the language that's been coming to me is the distinction between false power and true power. Uh, and false symbols and true symbols, but I'm not sure if I can use them right now. But these experiences that we have, and they're trying experiences, but they're experiences that punch us through the mm. fabric of false power and reconnect us with the true power that does in fact lie underneath it, always. And so that notion of portals, that notion of openings, right? it's an opening into something which is always here, but for whatever reason we're separated from and not able to access and not able to make our choices as a, you know, on the basis of. But yeah, th that, is, that is a real and powerful, let's say technology, that's a proper, proper term I think, mm -hmm. and necessary as part of the uh, sort of the whole bricolage that we're gonna cobble together in the next five years. I'm thinking here in terms of like, if you're flying to the moon, half the way is there, then you have to turn around and decelerate if you wanna land and not just crash into it. Right. Um, to get to that 10 year mark. But it's nice, it's hopeful to recognize that at the bottom of those dark pits are the openings into the true power that is in fact actually just there. Yeah. And it's more of our ability to come into relationship with it um, and to become more and more mm, sort of facile in navigating by means of that and uh, less and less attached to the false power mm -hmm. is maybe the, the key point. So we had an opportunity, it seems, with COVID. Mm -hmm. We had an opportunity for that to be a collective, a collective moment where we could all really come together. Sure enough. But it didn't work that way. And part of the reason it didn't work that way is we were being manipulated. The truth wasn't actually given into the field. And so in the absence of that truth, it created actually more division than it created a coming together. So Sebastian Junger's thesis in Tribe being that in these moments of existential crisis, people mm -hmm. will come together. We see flashes of that at, in a variety of different cases. I mean, he gives the story of the Blitzkrieg and the bombs falling on London and everybody mm -hmm. then becomes a Londoner. We saw a flash of that, a moment of that for whatever reasons. And also there's lots of little intricacies to this story, but at 9-11, you know, mm -hmm. everybody was a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter if you were from yeah. fucking Kansas, like you were a New Yorker there. Like if you were, if there was a firefighter that you saw like from New York fire or, or New York police department, like you took your cap off and you bowed and you said, thank you, you mm -hmm. know, cause we're all New Yorkers, we're all Americans at this point. And then of course, then there was the wars and then we're like, what the fuck is this all about? And so, mm -hmm. It feels like, you know, these existential challenges are actually <laughs> potentially necessary for our growth, but they have to be, they can't be weaponized against us in a way. Like we have to actually use them and we also have to have leaders uh -huh. that share them in, a, in an honest way. Otherwise, the opportunity is, is kind of lost and kind of hijacked. And it yeah. seems like we're going to have to have a different model because we're going to have to deal with some shit. And I'd love to go into like, I know that you see some of the shit that we may have to deal with. So I'd yeah. love to go into some of that and also, also double click on this idea of false power. But I just, I can't help but think like, man, we had, we had, we've had some of these moments and this most recent moment being the COVID moment, but it didn't generate it did in some aspects. It, there was some kind of communities that developed, but mm -hmm. they were polarized against each other. So it ended up dividing the country rather than unifying the country. And what a shame. What a, what a missed oh. opportunity. Yeah, that was definitely a missed opportunity in lots of different ways. So many things were going on in that period from like November of 2019 through to say March 2020. Yeah. The thing that like this future that we want to get to, it was beginning to happen. You know, people were beginning to self-organize. Mm -hmm. People were beginning to just take agency. They're beginning to take a look at how to do things and all the new techniques. Like there's a technique thing and there's a consciousness thing and they both need to happen simultaneously. You know, if you have a way, uh, uh, an uplifted consciousness, you have your ayahuasca experience and then your ass drops right back into your nine to five job in Shipville, mm -hmm. you got trouble, right? <laughs> you both have to happen simultaneously. Yeah. Um, or at least co-creatively, you know, co-produce right. each other. So yeah, I completely agree with you. Like there was a, uh, well, both missed opportunity, but also a bit of a revelation. So let's not forget mm -hmm. the revelation mm -hmm. aspect. Uh, a lot of people's eyes have been opened that weren't as open as they were before. Correct. And if we can't see clearly, then we can't navigate. So maybe just eye opening was enough. 
So I'll take it from that point of view. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We were able to see how some of the, the powers that be worked. I mean, regardless of your opinion about it, and there's a variety of different opinions, and it's not our place to argue about those opinions, but it's undoubtable that we saw manipulation mm -hmm. at play and we saw corporate capture of certain agencies and certain, you know, media agencies. And we saw a way in which it's like, oh, wow, you guys aren't, you guys aren't telling it. You guys aren't telling it true. You know, you're spinning, you're spinning things from the, you know, from the reports coming from the FDA that were hidden and tried to That's suppress right, right. from like all of the different ways that things were described. We're like, oh, there's something, there's something bigger and potentially more sinister that's happening here. And also a very real and scary, you know, situation that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And of course, some people took that fear and are still underneath that spell of fear. You know, I'm, I've been traveling around a lot and there's still people walking around outside with their masks on still. And that fear left an imprint of psychological, like a psychological trauma mm -hmm. almost to a certain extent that also no leadership, no true, like true power, mm -hmm. which is someone who's carrying the power with the goodness and clear, honest intention of their heart, you know, like the good king archetype, good, meaning they come from the field of goodness, mm -hmm. which is a field of honesty to really help like, hey, y'all, like, I know that this triggered a lot of fear, but it's no way to live your life to be afraid of the air for the rest of your existence. Like if you're afraid of the air for the rest of your existence, like this is tough. You might survive, but you're not gonna be living. Yeah. 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 So uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, we learned, it's, it's interesting. So what was coming to my mind right there was the notion of, um, it's a spiritual war, right? That's the sense yes. that came in. Yeah. And that in, in each particular phase or the moment of the evolution of war, the capacities that individuals and groups, communities have to learn to be able to prosecute that war properly, to, to emerge uh -huh. victorious, change. And World War II was a technological war. And World War II was where we harnessed the power of the intellect to change our technical capacities to engage in a wide variety of different activities to militarize intelligence. And whether you're talking about the Enigma machine, you're talking about radar, you're talking about uh, operational management, right? the application of the weaponization of intellect to coordinate militarization was World War II. Wait, what's the Enigma machine? Is that Oppenheimer? The, uh, no, this was uh, Bletchley Park and the pr uh, breaking of the German codes. Okay, yeah, 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 cryptography. Right? The Cold War was where we're living right now still in the tail end of that, right? There's the, the, uh, the war of sense-making, the war of propaganda, the war of manipulation, the war of hearts and minds, the war of how do you actually bounded by the threat of mutually assured destruction. And we can no longer play the game of throwing bombs at each other, uh, big picture. And big, big superpowers, Soviet Union, United States, can't play that game anymore. We've convinced ourselves that's no longer a valid thing, so it creates bump bumpers on what we can do, but we're still gonna be engaging in war, so how do we do it? Well, we need to use subtlety. I, mean, I need to get to, to undermine your, your economy, I need to undermine your politics, I need to make it impossible for you to coordinate all that kind of psychological psyops war. And, you know, also there's this interesting Cold War happening in space too, and I have dove into that as well, mm. where like Russians are blowing up their own satellites to create these debris fields to uh -huh. kind of capture certain real estate and prevent, you know, orbits, orbital patterns from different other, because it's like this, we're trying to figure out who can spy on the whole world right. in the best way. So there's little blips that you don't notice because they're in space, but it's still like, it's still an interesting thing. It's not the traditional kinetic warfare right. where bodies are lining up. Now, of course, Russia, Ukraine, there are bodies, tons of bodies lining up, and this is obviously tragic, but nonetheless, there is a sense like, well, we can't use the big bombs because right. once we use the big bombs, everybody uses the big bombs and it's all over. So it's almost been like a retraction of technology because we can't anymore, but still there's these flare ups of both kinetic and also, you know, strategic. And then, but definitely the, the biggest one is exactly, as you said, it's a war of stories. It's a war of the mind. It's a, yeah. war of, a war of consciousness. So for us to actually get through it, to emerge victorious, we have to actually learn how to pr properly prosecute a spiritual war. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what was going on in the context of COVID. Like people becoming aware of, okay, what makes me afraid? And how does my fear make it easy for me to be led and manipulated? 
What does it look like when somebody who I trusted is telling me a falsehood? How do I actually begin to notice that, that things like credentials aren't actually a, f- a functional proxy for <laughs> competence or good faith? Yes. Right? How do I navigate a world where I can't trust any institutions? Like these are all uh, questions that are very up. And individuals, none for better or for worse, and more importantly, communities, are having to learn how to do that. Like we're having to, in real time, uh, cobble together new capacities of interiority and new ca- capacities of relationality that allow us to respond to those challenges um, simply to, to survive, or at least to feel like we are actually living again, to recover that distinction between survival and living and start to saying, hey, wait a minute, I'd rather live. What is it, uh, live on my feet than die on my knees? That kind yeah, of idea. Yeah. Um, that's coming back. And I think that level of, uh, the, the term I used was infinitesimal courage, right? To mm. distinguish it against the, the coarse grain courage, which is a very noble thing, but the ability of those young men to charge the beaches at Normandy, that's coarse grain courage. We've been doing that for a long time. Mm-hmm. But the infinitesimal courage that goes all the way to the interior and allows, forces you to make the proper choices, even though nobody's looking and nobody will know the difference, that's a different kind of thing. I think that's a big part of what's being honed right now. I, it seems to me that we're also, with that, we're moving from a pre-tragic spirituality of either fundamentalism or atheism, mm-hmm. which is this kind of, pre- everything makes sense. Perfectly clear. Mm-hmm. There's no God. It's all just, you know, it's all just atoms that, you know, organized in a particular way. We don't exactly know why, but they did. So, and there's no God, and there's no, and then therefore there's no true value. And then in the postmodern idea, all values kind of taken off the table. It's all subjective. It's right. all, if you're doing that, well, if your culture says it's cool, then it's cool. There's no like universal value structure in that kind of atheist model. Or there's the fundamentalist value structure, which is God has said 2000 years ago or 3000 years ago, God has laid down the law and that's unchanging. And, and this is exactly how it is. And all of the interpretations by these organizations that we realize we can't really trust either, mm-hmm. you know, like clearly there's been a lot of fuckery going on with priests engaging in just for one example, engaging in horrific crimes against children that just kind of get moved around. And, and we know this is a fact. So let alone the doctrines of the religion, which have been manipulated mm-hmm. and been the cause of so many wars. So fundamental, fundamentalism is also discarded. So this pre-tragic notion isn't exactly working in either way, because one, you discard value. The other, you have stale values that are not evolving and not actually accessing the true field of value. And then it's reconfiguring in a new concept of what the divine actually looks like. That thing that you're beholden to, the thing that lives in you, as you, and through you, that kind of holds you in a field of value, a field of goodness, Mm -hmm. if you wanted to call it, like actual goodness, Mm -hmm. which is also something that we struggle with, like good (laughs) goodness, you know? So there's this, there's this interesting thing happening where I think Nietzsche correctly said, you know, God is dead at that time. And now it's like, well, we got to revive, we got to (laughs) revive the concept of the divine. Right. God is back. God is back, baby. <laughs> We're calling it here. Yeah. God is back. Yeah. It's funny. Nietzsche. I cut my teeth on Nietzsche. I had that experience of being a, a young adolescent and a good looking girl suggested something about Nietzsche. So I'm like, all right, Nietzsche it is. So I did a deep dive. <laughs> the, muse, the muse. The guides, muse. The muse is always <laughs> yeah. guiding you. So I've, uh, it's like mother's milk. So <laughs> yeah, I think this is right. I think there's a... Um, how do you say it? There's an adolescence. And that pre-tragic is nice. Pre-tragic has a certain adolescence sensibility to it. Mm-hmm. And there's a notable adolescence in the um, in both versions of the story that you told, right? The um, postmodern and the fundamentalist characteristics have a brittleness and a, a silliness, really, if you take it seriously. Yeah. Like, that can't be a way to run a life, much less a world. You just Can I just connect some dots here? Like, obviously, that ain't going to work. Yeah. If you could just imagine back, if you're kind of sitting back and somebody came to pitch you on this, here's the way we're going to do things. You're like, that's obviously nonsense. Like, I, I, I get why that's kind of a fun way to, you know, pick up chicks in grad school, but that's not a way to run anything, really. Yeah. I'm on the postmodern side, right. of course. <laughs> um, and we've looked around, and it's manifestly obvious there are no adults, adults in the room. So let me shift a little bit to mm-hmm. the sociological. Because mm-hmm. we live in a sociological moment that is, is, is unusual. That the last adults um, were probably the silent generation. 
and the last people who actually went through the process of really becoming elders, becoming grown-ups in the West. Maybe the GI. I'm not for sure, but certainly not the boomers. And that's what I'm looking at right now. Mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately, we've been living in an era of extraordinarily delayed maturity, mm -hmm. both physiologically and certainly spiritually. And there's an assumption, very unwarranted, that there are adults somewhere to be found that are ultimately either manipulating things negatively, right, the conspiracy side. Of course. There's sophisticated adults that are running things for their best interests. Or maybe actually will take care of us. Like we can appeal to somebody and they'll sort of figure it out and take care of us because we've grown up in an environment where more or less that has been the case. That there has been a powerful structure run by people who are meaningfully older than us, who have powers that in many cases feel mythological. And until you've actually met people first face to face, you don't realize that presidents are just fucking people. Mm -hmm. You don't realize that movie stars are very unimpressive individuals. Like you just don't get it until you've met them face to face. There's a mythological characteristic to them. And so we behave as if somebody else is, gonna, is responsible for what's happening. Um, but reality over the past several years, for me, decades, but certainly the past five years or so for many people, has, again, revelation, pulled back the veil. And you look around, you're like, fuck, it's us? Like, we're it? We're the ones who are going to have to figure this stuff out? We're the ones we've been waiting for, the old prophecy. That's right. We're the ones. Huh. That's on the, on the, on the one hand, extremely alarming. <laughs> because we have not got our shit figured out at all. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose empowering, because I guess it's up to us. Yeah. Um, and I know from my life experience that it, once you've accepted responsibility and just stop fit, fitting about and dive into it, amazing things can happen. Mm -hmm. um, I think we were talking about that on the front. It's like when you live in crazy times, crazy things can happen. Now, we know the crazy shit's happening to us, but that also means that we can do crazy things. So should, we should take Amen. advantage of that opportunity. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I've personally felt that deeply, man, deeply. I've felt, not only have I felt this kind of ex expose of the darker forces, the manipulative forces, the mm -hmm. revelation of, oh, wow, the authorities, what I would call empire. Mm -hmm. Empire is not on our team. Mm -mm. They are not on our team. They want to debase, degrade, control us. You know, one thing about empire, they love wars. They love being in perpetual war, but they hate warriors. They hate the people mm. who find that courage yeah. within themselves, right? So they have all of these different <laughs> ideas and strategies that are being deployed. And then there's something else. There's what we can see and feel, what our brother Charles Eisenstein said, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. We know that there's a different way. Mm -hmm. This self-organizing kingdom that yes, does have structure, has some of the structures of empire, but is led from a field of goodness and that we can all participate in and all have both you know, bilateral communication up and down and everybody's listening to each other and there's this, other possibility that we're starting to see as well. And it seems like we're heading towards one of two paths. Mm -hmm. To me, it feels like the idea, and some people are gonna hate this, but the idea of some form of one world government is ultimately a necessary inevitability. Like it's somehow there's gonna have to be greater coordination for us to withstand the existential threats, which involve the entire species. So right. the reason is this is a necessity because there's things that involve the entire species. It's not just about your country or your state. It's the, to the totalization of the world. So if we're gonna deal with problems that involve the totalization of the world, we're gonna have to have some level of coordination. Now, that doesn't mean that people have to give up their culture or give up their states or give up their countries, but there has to be a way that things are organized. It's a lot more honest than the United Nations, which still picks which countries are involved and mm -hmm. who they actually give a shit about and is wildly corrupt from everything that, that we can see. But it's almost like the move is going to be made and it's either going to be this dystopian top-down control empire version or it's going to be the kingdom, the mm -hmm. good kingdom. You yeah. know? And in the good kingdom, there are good kings and there's still structure and there's still ways in which things move, but it's led from a whole different mindset, a whole different, different concept. So I think it's probably worth pointing out that you and I have never met. Right. Uh, we obviously have a couple of folks in common, mm -hmm. but I bring this up because there's a lot of convergence. Um, uh, I'm nodding my head vigorously what you're saying. In fact, even the language, um, empire versus kingdom. Like I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree very, very deeply. And let me just 
you said some people are gonna, gonna hate this. So let's just call out the distinction. Cause I think it's not, if you can get it, it's not that troubling, but if you can't get it, if you're confused by it, then the ones, the warriors will want to resist. Right. So let's, let's, let's give them some, uh, there's a distinction between something let's call it one world empire. Uh huh. And there's something else we could call the spiritual kingdom just yeah. to make a distinction. Kingdom of Gaia. Yeah. Something, King. something that is planetary in scope, uh-huh. right? That includes the whole of humanity and the whole of nature and the whole of technology and is able to coordinate the choices that are made by the individuals so that those choices are consistently in alignment with both their own local best, right? We are guided and supported by the world that we're in so that our lives are the richest and most meaningful that they can be and are intrinsically in support of the much larger whole, Mm -hmm. right? That's the thing we're trying to head towards. (laughs) And the simulation of that, the false power, right? The negative image of that, that is grasping at us and trying to take that image and convert it into the tools to be used against us, that's the empire. And that's how the empire operates. We can spend some time, I think, diagnosing how false power does what it does so that we don't find ourselves confused because we're divided against ourselves by the propaganda or the manipulation or the deceptions that come from the false power. Um, Well, then, of course, we've been divided, we fall. Mm. And so this is a word that's going out to the warriors, the ones who... When you feel the empire called out, you feel yourself rallied. Like yeah. my, my, the hair on my arm stood out. Like part yeah. of, a huge part of me and the fact that my entire lineage exists for the purpose to serve the kingdom against the empire. And it is Let's only go. because I'm aware of the fact that we're in a spiritual war that I don't just gear up and go rush directly at it. Because obviously it knows how to win that war. Right? So don't do that. Well, and also you can fall into the trap of trying to locate empire within people. Yeah, that's right. And instead of it being like Ragnarok, like the war of the gods, the war of ideas, the war of stories, where it's not somebody you shoot with a gun, it's not somebody you punch with a fist, it's not somebody you yell at and abuse on Instagram. They may be participating in this ideology of empire. And so there may be some contention between your story and their story, but don't forget, like these are all our people. That's right. They're all our people, and we have to remember that. And this war is being played out in the spiritual, you know, in the consciousness dimensions. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, hard to hold on to because sometimes it would feel nice to punch something in the face. <laughs> of course, right? It feels really like the kind of thing that needs to happen. <laughs> but yeah. right, that that particular avenue has been largely uh, taken, right? And that's, that that adds energy to the to the way the adversary is doing what it does. And keeping us fighting against each other. I saw a little thread that came through. Some people brought it to my attention where uh, on Team Red over here yep. in Twitter sphere, uh, some, I'll say young woman, I guess I'm old enough to say that. I don't know how old she was. In Ohio, I think, uh, quoted, you know, salvation is through Christ alone, which is a very uncontroversial statement within Protestantism. Um, very, a very strong pre-tragic fundamental statement. Yeah. And, very, yeah. and you're going to find that. I don't know anything, I don't know her personally, so I don't have any idea what her background is. And then uh, at least two individuals from the Ohio State, one of whom was definitely Jewish because he brought that forward, said that's the most bigoted statement I've ever heard. And and then, by the way, delete it or take it down, which was very odd. I guess they must have known each other. Um, And this uh, initiated a little bit of a firestorm in meme space, right, inside Twitter. And I can tell you this, the Empire was happy to see that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's get that conflict and all little fractures, all little the doctrinal differences. Let's make sure that those are the places where energy and attention are focused because that'll keep people well engaged and keep their energy and their desire to punch focused in a particular direction while the empire can continue doing its business very, very unabated. In fact, fueled by that. Mm-hmm. And that's a false symbol that allows us to pull our energy, our, our actual power into the wrong place. And every time we do that, we're weakening ourselves and strengthening our adversaries. Mm-hmm. Um, Hmm. Well, you know, so what I think, all right, so then what is the, what is the, the higher choice in the response to that? And mm-hmm. so my choice, if somebody says that to me is like, like the Christ, like I know about the Christ. Mm-hmm. The Christ is an incredibly powerful force. It's the awakening of this universal love, this love that knows no fear, that knows, you know, sees beyond judgment still can hold discretion, but comes from this flaming heart. So many images of our past 
artists inspired by the different muses of their own, whether it's the muse of the divine, showed Christ with a flaming heart, just a heart that was on fire. And so to say that the Christ is going to play a, play a role, this Christ energy is going to play a role in our salvation. You know what? You're right. It is. It is going to play a big role, but it's not alone. And it's also probably not exactly what you mean by Christ. However, you know, like there's some power there and I want to acknowledge that. And so that's the way that you kind of build the bridge, I think, to people who have these ideas to say, Christ, hell yeah. You know, like I'm down and I'm, and I'm from a Hebrew lineage myself. I'm wearing the star of David on my chest right now and a <laughs> sword, right? Like I'm from the Hebrew lineage oh, and there's right, been a nice. traditional yeah. split, but it's like, oh no, yeah, the, the Christ, there's something there. There's something there, whether you use the Rosicrucian model or you just have your own understanding, there's power there. And I, I see where you're going with that, except there's an expanded view that you need to look at, that this is one way to name one of the forces that we need to bring to the table. Man, my sense is one of, um, when, I, when I encounter something like that, what I know is I don't understand how to deal with it properly. Mm -hmm. Meaning the only response I can usually have is humility. Something is being shown to me. I don't understand it. So time to listen. Yeah. And what's happening here? I noticed that um, this is word discernment that at least I, in myself, I have a feeling of an ability to distinguish from things that are in the right direction mm -hmm. and things that are more in the wrong direction. Yep. So this would be an invitation to say, okay, tell me more. And what I find oftentimes is when somebody is speaking from their heart, it's in the right direction. Yeah. And if they're speaking stories that have been put in their mind by people other than themselves, yeah, it oftentimes feels like it's more in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. So I want to listen. I want to hear, like, what's really coming from the heart? What's coming from truth, capital T? Because mm -hmm. there is capital T truth. I mean, just postmodernists are going to hate that. They're going to hate that. And that's going to be all right. They're going to have to chew on that one until they work their way through it. I'm sorry yeah. for that, but you're going to have to grow up sometime, kids. Um, yeah, we're, we're way past grad school. So, so what is it? And then I, have a, I have a friend, I'm not going to name her, but I actually had this conversation with her. I said, you know, when you speak to me about your first person experience, what you're feeling inside, and you're just conveying, you're out of the way, and you're just telling me what it is you're experiencing, it's truth like mm -hmm. it is clear water and i just want to drink it down but as soon as you start telling me stories that you're making up in your head to make sense of it it goes off the rails so fast yeah <laughs> yeah and we live in confusing times and we've got a lot of stories and people have been optimizing stories for a long time we need to be mindful of that optimizing slash weaponizing yeah that's what i mean yeah, yeah. like you know, the mimetic the, the the toolkit of taking advantage of this thing we can do that we've been playing with very awkwardly for you know the past 75,000 years or so, and very sophisticated for the past 10,000 years or so, and off the charts for the past couple hundred years, that's been going on a long time. So we should be careful. Storytelling is a potent, potent tool, and nefarious forces are quite skillful at weaponizing it. Empire. Yeah, empires, that's what they do. Mm -hmm. That's their shtick. <laughs> so. Yep, and they got all kinds of strategies. They love hiding in the holy, too. Oh, boy. They love hiding behind some virtue or some value or some quote God that they've created and manipulated so that they find themselves in a position that they, you know, they're in, it's this almost invulnerable position because they're claiming this authority of value or authority of virtue that if you challenge it, yep. then, oh, you want to kill grandma or you want to do all. So there's all of these ways in which their story wow. allows them to access a certain virtue which they're unaware they're blind they don't have the awareness to see that they're actually being manipulated to try and be better than somebody else by believing this story oh it's so brutal yeah so let's see let me do this in two two steps to because i feel like the, i want to take the first part and just kind of flesh it out but the second part will respond to what you're just saying which is it's brutal um so false symbols and true symbols um false symbols are simulations of true symbols that render the most salient aspect super salient. And so what happens is, is I have a relationship with a particular symbol. And as a human being, I can only experience so much of it. And some portions of it stick out in the foreground. And what happens is what a false symbol does is it takes that aspect and gives me more of that. And, and I mean, this must just be very, uh, very simple, like very straightforward. 
Um, there was an experiment that I read about a long time ago about some scientists who took a, uh, a, a bird, a mother bird, and they created a little hand puppet, a baby bird, and they made the baby bird's mouth, let's say, redder, more red, their fake one, than the real baby bird's. And they just kept playing around with it until they figured out what was the mama bird really using, her symbolic interpretation of complex reality. She obviously can't really understand everything that's going on. She has to simplify it to the thing that a bird bird can, can handle. Mm. And in this case, it turned out to be a patch of red against the otherwise non-red background meant baby bird mouth put food in there. And so the scientists were able to produce a simulated baby bird that was ever so more red, more symbolically potent than the real baby bird, guess what? Mama started feeding the, the puppet and all of her babies died. That's a false symbol, mm. right? Now there's a lot of power in being able to figure out how to jack people's symbolic landscapes and provide them false symbols because then they'll give you the power, the energy that they're endeavoring to give to the world or to the, to the things that they love and care about because they can't tell the difference. Right? You're, you're signaling to them the things that they use to distinguish from uh, reality from non-reality, truth from falsehood. You're right inside. You're signal jacking their own sense-making infrastructure. It's very difficult to get past that. Mm. All right. So back to the point you were making. Brutal. Like how, how can we ask people to not be jerked around by manipulative discourse like you're going to kill grandma? You know, that's very challenging. We're asking people to uh, operate an IQ of like 140. And with an EQ of 160, and we're mm -hmm. talking about requiring human beings to, to level up their capacities in a way that feels, frankly, impossible. Um, that's brutal. How are we going to pull that off? This is what I mean. If I say something like, be careful of those who wear the vestments of the holy and do not trust them. Well, what are you going to do? <laughs> What's the average person going to walk out and say, right. well, now who do I trust? Right. Can't trust anybody? Well, that's not a very healthy place to be. This gets us into the kind of the QAnon scenario where we unplug all forms of trust. Then people are looking everywhere and you get apophenia off the charts, which isn't, by the way, fed by delusion. I went deep in the QAnon thing, right? We're living in a world of massive deception. So there's plenty of true things that have been hidden from us that you can pull up and go, shit, look at that. Here's a true thing that's been hidden from us. I got a you know, positive dopamine hit for finding something true and real that has in fact actually been hidden. Keep mining for it, you keep finding it. That's going to feed a whole group of people who are like, all right, fair enough. Layer on top of that, whatever construct happens to accumulate to it, and you've got an ideology. You've got a, a cult, ultimately. Yeah, and, and then it leads into places where they've grossly overstepped and exactly. been like, corrupted. You get the flat earthers, you get dinosaurs aren't real, and then all of a sudden, you're no different than the creationists. You're you stuck. Know, well, you're stuck. You're, you're stuck just confused. In, you're just yeah. in this place where you can't trust anything. You can't trust anybody. Everybody's a false, everything's a false flag. Everybody's controlled opposition. Right. There's nobody who's actually good. So get yourself a bunker, buy a bunch of guns, find yourself a piece of land and fuck the rest of the world. You're going to survive. And that's not going to work. Yeah. But, but by the way, not the worst place to start. Uh, no, okay. but what I mean is something like step back. And be, be willing to step back. And where do we reground? And I found, in my experience, there's really only two places that we can, we can reground, and they're bizarrely antipodes. Uh, one, of course, is human relationship. You know, if, if you encounter a family, and you encounter the children are healthy, you can look at the face, and you can see the activity. The child is a healthy child, physically, spiritually, emotionally, four-year-old. They know how to play. Mm -hmm. They're not afraid of the world. Right? They're not afraid of their parents. And you look at the adults. The adults have a good relationship with each other and with their child. Like something right is happening there. That is good signal. Mm. Right? You can do the same thing with just nature. Right? If you go out and you can drink from the water in the ground, you remember? We're old enough to remember that actually was a thing that you could do. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before we poisoned everything. I remember reading a book in the 70s. It was weird. It almost was like science fiction. I'm sure this guy was like an old, like, uh, what would you call him? The Lost Generation. Mm. Like one of those guys grew up in the 20s. He wrote this book and it was almost this prophecy about how terrible it was going to be in the future that we were all going to drink bottled water. Mm. Like people aren't going to drink from streams anymore. They aren't going to drink from taps. All the water will be so toxic that we have to carry bottles around with us everywhere we go. I remember as a kid simultaneously going, that's absurd, sir. That's, a, that's just crazy talk. And a feeling in my gut of like, that would be a terrible world to live in. And I remember watching it was like, everybody seems to be buying bottled water all the time. 
That's weird. This guy called it. All right. Well, if you go to a place where people can actually drink from the water in the ground, that's healthy. That's a good mm-hmm. sign. Mm-hmm. If you have a place where people intuitively and collectively gather because they actually like each other and they recognize that conviviality is healthy and where if somebody is having trouble, everybody else helps them, this is, this is the word wholesome, right? What was that gentleman's name? Oh, gosh. He's a British guy who creates videos, music videos of people like Jordan Peterson talking. Music videos. Yeah, they're amazing. Anyway, he, mm-hmm. he coined, he, for me at least, he coined the phrase, wholesome is the new punk. Mm. And so wholesomeness, we can recognize. And the more wholesome you get, the more you can recognize wholesomeness. That's a very nice feedback loop. Grounding in wholesomeness is a good idea. Yeah. Deep. Places that have multi-generational wholesomeness, places that have been able to maintain continuity of real human relationship and healthiness for a long period of time. And by the way, humility, because you don't want to fuck it up if you're going there. You can get ground there and that's good solid stuff. And this is not, by the way, prepper separatism. Well, I experienced something similar when I was in Kuwait. You know, uh-huh. so we were there yeah. with uh, we we're there with our friend Alana, who's a local, lived there, and quite deeply embedded in the community. And we brought together a gathering for like a fundraiser and a prayer for the people of Maui. We're in mm-hmm. Kauai, which was you know this Edenic place, and then there's this hell going on on our sister island of Maui. So we brought the community together, and it was really beautiful to actually feel this community of locals because mm-hmm. Kauai doesn't have the same level of tourism it still has a lot of tourism but there's a there's a strong community i'm sure there is in every island as well and from any everyone from you know native hawaiians of hawaiian ethnic lineage to people who've lived there and just been there and been a part of it and there's a sacred spring everybody fills their water at the sacred <laughs> spring and every single person told us like you got to go to the spring you got to drink the sacred water from the sacred spring and they didn't use necessarily sacred in this way but it right, was, right. but you could tell yep. that that's what they felt about it like this is our spring like this is where we get water and this is fucking <laughs> important right so it was exactly yeah. that thing they had that and as i was looking around you know looking around this gathering that we had at a local yoga studio black coral yoga and there was just a certain quality to the eyes of some people that were there Mm -hmm. where I was just able to look around and go like, oh, brother, oh, sister, like, I don't know you, but I know you. We're in the same field of value. We're in the same, like, if we, the the longer we spent talking, the more we'd realize how much we liked each other. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that much time right now. <laughs> we all have our own agendas, but I see, I fucking see you. Yep. And I think it was connected to the community, was actually connected also from the waters to the earth. And there's this really interesting way where you felt like, wow, here's a little pocket. Here's a little place yep. where things are in right order. You know, where like the rainmaker doesn't have to come to set things back in right order because there's actually a right order that exists, self-emergent from this kind of, from, from this community. And it was, it was really cool to see that yeah, in a way and to actually feel like, oh, wow, there's still pockets that exist. And that's certainly not the only one, but there's many pockets that exist where people are still accessing this. Yeah. And so from a, from a, what do I do perspective, the short, the short answer, at least for most people is find pockets like that and then become someone who can participate in a healthy, wholesome way with those pockets. And that is how the steps there. And don't, don't rush to Kauai right now and break it. Right? Don't fuck it up. Don't bring your nonsense <laughs> yeah, yeah. there. That's don't bring, don't bring your terrible nonsense. idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, um, oh, actually, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story about that because we're doing, we're, we're invoking the Hawaiian sensibility. So we, now we have to talk story. Uh-huh. Um, so I almost moved to Kauai. Um, and the way that I understand it is the, 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 the Kauai, or specifically the way I understand it is the Waiali Ali, brought me in to teach me important lessons about how to be in right relationship with, with the place itself and um, what home feels like, both in terms of place and people. And as you say, I, I know exactly the experience you're talking about. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, simple, simple metrics like uh, my daughter was around two to three during the time that we were there. And... You show up in a local car, not a, not a rental car. You show up at a local beach. And you have a, a kid who's butt naked running around, nut brown on the beach. And the other people on the beach look at you and they notice that you're at least somewhat Pono. Mm-hmm. Okay, more or less, you're your family now, you're Ohana. 
Right? Mm -hmm. Your daughter, my daughter can run over there and hang out with your family and eat some watermelon with your family. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, 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 the notion is that if one of your kids runs over and wants to jump on my surfboard, you know, I got an eye out and it's all good. Right. Yeah. And that was a, a revelation, right? Growing up, or not, not growing up, but living in the suburbs of Southern California at the time, the notion of, wait, relationship has an easefulness and a depth to it. And taking care of each other's children can actually be a natural, ordinary thing. Oh, and by the way, I notice local beaches, very clean. Mm. There's no trash because you take care of your place, right? And if somebody leaves trash behind, that is super not Pono. And either they're making a significant error, in which case some uncle needs to come and tell them off, mm -hmm. or they're a tourist, in which case they need to be, you know, gently ushered to a different location, <laughs> um, which would be a holiday. So, so I was taught that. And then Wiley Ali said, and by the way, this is not your home. And this is what it feels like. I'm gonna bring you all the way in to feel like it's home and how to be, how to take things in the proper pace and how to listen and to notice. And we got to the place of literally putting an offer on a house. You know, capitalism affords me the ability to convert mammon's money units into owning a piece of property in somebody else's place. It's very difficult to navigate that. And following the path as cleanly as possible, at the very last second, literally the last day, it got popped in a very confusing fashion. But the, the offer was much larger offers came in on the day that the documents are going to be signed, cash only. Wow. Okay. I guess I'm not supposed to be here. So we processed that for a while and we've now landed in Black Mountain, North Carolina mm. and after a couple of, of hops, by the way. And the sense was, oh, uh-huh. The lesson of home was taught, but that wasn't my home. Mm. So it's important. You actually have a home and it's yours and <laughs> you got to find mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Once you found it and you understand how to know the difference, then you can start going down. And then he starts grounding in this way. And the empire can't take that from you. I mean, the empire can try to kill you. Yeah. Right? Once you found a, a hill to die on, that's where the kingdom can be born. Right. right. That's where the warriors have a place to play. Oh, this is my hill to die on? Hallelujah. I've been mm -hmm. looking for this my whole life. Now I know where it is. Yeah. And I know what to defend. And I know who to defend. And you get that weird feeling. Like, I, again, I'm feeling in my arms. That feeling of like, I see the kids walking around on Black Mountain. I'm like, right. those are mine to protect. The empire comes for them. Yeah, they come, I'll through, die for them. come through me first. That's right. So the other side, and right? we got that part, and that part feels really good, right? And by the way, if you're married, family, wife, you know that kind of thing, you want to make your wife feel good. Bring her into her home mm -hmm. with her community, and in a place where all the other people have the feeling of yeah, they'll take care of your kids too, and that she's invited to co-parent. And I don't mean like we're talking about it a lot up here. It actually is happening. Mm -hmm. And there's a felt sense of like grandmothers inviting her to come in and actually steward the beauty of the land, like that kind of stuff. That'll make a, a wife feel extremely good. I can tell you this first person. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other side is the weirdest thing in the world. The other side is this technological thing. Because we've been doing that. We're going to have to figure out how to come into mastery of it pretty quick, too. Because the AI guys have finally lit the fuse. So it feels like the clock's ticking at long last. I don't know about you, but... I was a nerd growing up, so I've been watching the tech thing since as long as I was, well, probably about seven or eight. And there's been a feeling of there will be a point at which the train leaves the station, right? where the technology thing is, can begin, is, is, is moving in a sort of an eschatological fashion, and there's going to be an end of days that is going to be brought forth by the simple exponential growth of technology. And it seems like the, the AI boys have lit that fuse, and the... Uh, the train has left the station. So we've got a very limited amount of time to figure out how to integrate this problem child of humanity known as technology. So, all right, so let's, let's slow down and unpack yeah. a couple of these things. So when you're talking about technology, there's many aspects of technology. So break down the specifics of what type of technology you're talking about. I know you referenced AI. Mm -hmm. And then also what that end of days looks like because we also we all understand kind of the social dilemma we also under, we understand the kind of techno feudalism that's yeah, yeah, yeah. you know a term that you know zach stein who i know is a, a buddy of yours and you know that they've kind of been focused on but it's not exactly end of days it's just a degradation of a it's a degradation of our sovereignty and it's hijacking of our attention but i wouldn't necessarily call that end of days it's an end it's a shift that's going to be be difficult but so so go yep. a little slow yeah let me slow and down. unpack like what technology you're talking about is this the social technology is this weapon you know no, actual I'm kinetic weapon technology te technology qua technology uh, so what i'm talking about is the the ability of the human mind to 
abstract characteristics of reality to foreground the elements that are purposeful, the ones that we, we prefer, and then to design mechanisms that allow us to optimize or select from reality the, the, our preferences and to reduce or eliminate uh, the things that, that we prefer not to have. Uh -huh. right? So this could be in any domain. Agricultural technology does this in the context of food. Um, uh, military technology does this in, in the context of other people's power. Right? So technology is simply that, that game of using the mind to abstract, to model reality. By virtue of modeling it, we can actually pull forth things like principles and characteristics that allow us to then engage in the process of design that allows us to then reconfigure the reality that we live in, right? Technology is nothing more than a reconfiguring of an existing reality in furthering alignment with our preferences, which is to say to increase the power of our will in relationship with how the reality actually plays vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. us, right? Now, the downs, so the upside of technology, of course, is where we are. We live in a world where we have air conditioning in Texas in the summer, which I recognize as a boon. And that we can do things like record our conversations that anybody else who wants to see them can choose to, which mixed emotions about that one. <laughs> um, here's the downside. The downside is our minds are very limited. That technology is fundamentally participates in the epistemological category that a gentleman named Ed, Ed, uh, or Dave Snowden brought to me called complicatedness as opposed to complexity. So complexity is complex reality. It's nature qua nature, and right? it's the, the thing that is, is actually infinite in its uh, infinitesimal and its nuance and, and its uh, relationality. We can't really ever understand it, and it will change and grow and evolve. Novelty will emerge. Complicatedness is our models. Right? Map versus territory is a pretty standard way of describing it. And technology is, is strictly bound to our models. Technology is strictly bound to the complicated. And what that means is that as we increase our power, we increase simultaneously the presencing of that which we, at least within our narrow desires, prefer. And we increase the degree to which we're throwing shit into the natural environment that we don't actually see or understand because we've elided it from our vision. Mm -hmm. Economics calls that externalities. Now, of course, in our narrow vision, we may not understand, let's say, for example, our ability to foreground, let's go with estrogen, for purposes that are very particular, like to make skin green. Well, as soon as that skin cream washes off and gets into the water supply, it now becomes an externality that is going into nature in a way that breaks a lot of stuff that nature operates with. Mm -hmm. Multiply that by literally everything. <laughs> um, and by, by the way, a lot of people and by a long period of time. And so that's the, uh, the, the, the problem child of technology, which we have not really dealt with. Right? The only way we've been able to deal with technology thus far is more technology. Mm -hmm. and. I think any alcoholic can give you a sense of where that ends up. Mm -hmm. All right. And by the way, I'm, I'd love to have a conversation with Mark Andreessen on this because I think he had an opportunity about a year ago to go through an initiatory process and pop through and something happened where he's basically just doubled down. I can't tell whether that's a game or whether he's just decided to give up and accept the fact that he's going to be the kind of the Oppenheimer of this, of this era. I don't understand. I don't know who that guy is. Oh, Mark you Andreessen. Want... He's the guy who created Netscape. Okay. And then uh, created a, a venture fund called Andreessen Horowitz and has been funding a lot of stuff, and he's become one of the leading kind of Silicon Valley <clears throat> billionaire intellectuals behind effective accelerationism. AI is going to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. Run. Right? That, that sort of a particular ideology. You're right. Although I, I have to admit, I haven't been following him closely enough recently. There may be more nuance to it than I'm picking up. So then what's the other side? The other side is this uh, question of the end of days. Right. Did you see the movie Oppenheimer? I didn't, but I heard it was fucking great. <laughs> yeah, it's real good. Now, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to just sort of lay out the last yeah, scene. Yeah, please. So, uh, spoiler alert, the last scene. Um, beautifully done, right? Because given uh, Nolan's methodology, he slices time apart. So we have a series of events that keep occurring in the movie linearly, in our experience, that all kind of build to a moment at the end. So we have Oppenheimer having a conversation with Einstein at a pond in uh, Princeton. And what we see from the outside is that Oh, he knows Einstein. Oh, oh my gosh, what's he, what are they going to talk about? Oppenheimer wops up, has a conversation. And then we see that Einstein walks out sort of visibly upset. We're not quite sure what he talked about. The last scene, we get to find out what they talked about. And um, earlier in the arc, when they first, maybe the first time they meet, the, the folks working on the Manhattan Project had run out the math where they said, wait, 
there may be a possibility of a chain reaction that when we actually ignite the bomb, it'll start an uncontrollable chain reaction that will actually ignite the entire atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's a splitting. Very so, and, and that, and as far as I understand it, that when you split one atom, the energy created could split other atoms, right. which could then create this cascading effect of in, in just the ambient atmosphere, in, indefinite, yeah, right, right. indefinite nuclear reactions. You got it. And there's a sort of a non-zero risk. And the, the mass, like non-zero risk. How big? Well, non-zero. <laughs> so they brought it to Einstein, at least in the story. I don't know if this yeah. really happened. Um, and Einstein looks at it and goes, "Sounds like it's your fucking problem. I'm like, yeah, yeah. this is beyond my math. You've got better mathematicians on it." You know, you got it. And the, they decided to go forward with the process. And, um, but here's, the, here's the, the closer. And this is my interpretation of it. So Oppenheimer is looking at the, the pond, watching the raindrops hit and the ripples sort of ripple out. And he's mindful of the fact that now we've moved past the, the, uh, the atomic bomb to the hydrogen bomb. And because of course, game theory, as soon as we had the atomic bomb, that was eventually going to escape. By the way, it doesn't matter by what means. In this case, a particular spy that was in the Manhattan Project sent information over to the Russians. It doesn't matter. Information will get out. The Russians had to have a bomb. They had to have symmetry in the arms race. Mm. Well, as soon as the Russians had the bomb, we had to have the H-bomb. So mm. This is the escalation curve, right? The arms race has an escalation curve to it. Now, when you move from the A-bomb to the H-bomb, and you move to the H-bomb with multiple people having the H-bomb, you enter into mutually assured destruction, right? Mutually assured destruction is just the simplicity that the power that we're dealing with, the amount of power that we have embodied in hydrogen bombs past a certain small number, is if we pop over into using them, we break stuff so badly that it's the end of the, end of the world. And then the end of the world, right? Human nature combo. Sure. The end of days, right? So that's the first moment. And Oppenheimer was living that very deeply, right? He was living that experience. But what he noticed was that there was a cascade effect. The arms races are moving off in every direction. And so when I look at it, he says to Einstein, he says, remember, Albert, when we thought that when we, when we set off this atomic bomb, there was a possibility that we would actually set up a chain reaction that would end the world? And he says, yeah, but I, you know, I guess the math proved that it wouldn't happen that way. And Oppenheimer says, I think we did that. Meaning, when I read it, mm. he recognized that they were now in a game theoretic arms race mm. that had a terminus. And that terminus was, when we have access to a power or tool, we will eventually use it. We've been boxing ourselves in. Right? We, we created this box of safety called the Cold War. So, all right, we're not going to cross these boundaries. And back in the 40s and 50s, the boundaries, even the 60s and 70s, the boundaries were actually pretty simple. Meaning, two guys had to avoid pushing one button each. As long as Kennedy and Khrushchev did not fire the bombs, the world was safe. Our power was, was catastrophic at the level of nuclear hostility. But as long as we didn't cross that threshold, we were okay. And by the way, as I'm sure you know, we barely crossed that threshold. There were several circumstances that may have crossed the threshold. There was, there was one story. This is just a small bracket to open up. And I have, in fact, checked this story. But the story goes, and as, as it was told to me, and again, apologies that I haven't fact checked and researched the, the details of this story, but there was a Russian nuclear submarine at some point that received communication during some point, potentially Cuban Missile Crisis, potentially some other thing, received a communication that the U.S. had launched a military strike, mm -hmm. uh, an atomic hydrogen military strike. And they then lost, lost further communication. And so it was actually the captain of this submarine that had to decide like, well, my job is to counterattack in this instance. That's what I've been told. But he found some aspect of a warrior inside himself and some aspect of consciousness, whether guided by external, you know, forces that be or his own internal goodness and sense where he's like, we cannot do this. Mm -hmm. We cannot do this. And he, and he himself made this one decision like not to launch it. Cause those are interesting places as well. You have a communication lapse, you get Absolutely. a false signal and then one person could have actually ended the world or not ended the world. And of course he made the right choice. There were no, there were no nuclear strikes that are happening. So that would be an interesting story to look up, make sure that that's, that's a reality. But even if it's not, this is the world we're living in. Sometimes there's some fucking close shaves yeah. that we're not even aware of. And there may be even more of these close shaves that haven't even reached, you know, haven't gotten declassified. Well, we'll, we'll let's hold that as an archetype because the story continues from there. So let's hold that as an archetype. Yeah. That, that individual happened to have been holding on to a, a potency or a quantity of power, 
where his choice to act or not to act was decisive. All right. But now let's shift back to this escalating arms race in every direction. So let's think like, well, let's go with COVID. Let's go with the, the weaponization of viral technology. Uh, I am, I was convinced as of like January of 2020 that this was a lab produced phenomenon. The evidence for that was strong enough even then to be 80% confident. My confidence has gone up since then. Um, oh, it's been fairly well acknowledged at, at this, this point. point. Yeah. <laughs> at this point, they're like, man, yeah, more or less than more or less. Trust in who not to more try. or less. Um, yeah. But you were a conspiracy theorist for a little while. There. I sure was. Yeah. Let's <laughs> um, just say I paid attention to logic and evidence and, and noticed <laughs> who was giving me very, very easy to disprove lies. Right. And I remember looking and I think it was in science, very like in February, there was a sort of a very strong like lab leak debunked, obviously his zoonotic origin. I got, it was sort of spreading around. It was a, a major journal. It's like, how about if I read it? I'll just read the damn <laughs> thing. I took a look at it and I read it. I was like, this is specious. Like the logic is, is weak beyond comprehension. There's no way this could, could actually get published as a real article. Uh -huh. So strong evidence that somebody's full of shit, right? Yeah. Either people are panicking and they're just trying to cover their ass or worse, but you know, team zoonotic gets a debit because their shit was clearly specious. Fair enough, right? Just keep going down the sense-making architecture. But here's the, here's the kind of the, the, the closing key point, which is, okay, so we explore the frontier of weaponizing viruses. Okay, fair enough. We're also exploring the frontier of weaponizing cyber war in a world that is increasingly cybernetic. And what happens if somebody pushes a virus button, a computer virus button that say, turns off all the electricity? and we can't turn it back on for like three days. Things get pretty bad pretty quick. Um, drones, you know, what's going on in the Ukraine? If you ever read a book uh, by, a, by a gentleman named Manuel de Landa back in, I think, 95, a long time ago, called War in the Age of Intelligent Machines. And he more or less called what we're looking at right now, which is war has a habit of causing people to take away all the safeties and just start engaging in a arms race. Um, Drone technology and the ability to actually use drones in more is now going through the World War II acceleration curve. Mm -hmm. And um, drones can lead us into a place of mutual assured destruction. Right? We can have swarms of drones taking out vulnerable supply chains and, and locations in uh, uh, logistics that break down complicated late capitalist society. Right? We live in a highly, highly fragile environment. Right. And, uh, and then one of the other risks, and then another small bracket is, Drones are like, there's a big, there's a big curve to get to actually atomic or hydrogen bomb capability. Yep. The technology there is extreme mm -hmm. and not impossible for some, but for a non-state agent to figure out, but close enough to impossible that it's very low on the risk threshold that somebody in their basement is going to figure out and have the access to the tech and the science you and the capability to make it. Swarms of drones? with enough money, you know, and, you know, the ability to make explosive devices or whatever else, like it becomes actually a real possibility yep. that non-state agents could actually control these, you know, drone swarms. Yeah, absolutely. And we've been seeing this in, in the world of cyber. I mean, back when I was a, a hacker, we called them script kiddies. These are like kids who can't actually write the code to hack, but as soon as you write the code, they can run the code. So they get the power of the code that's written by somebody else. And all the technologies for psyops that have been developed by, let's say, for example, state agencies and commercial agencies for the 20th century, every generation blurred just, distinction, yeah, blurred distinction for sure. <laughs> um, um, those become available, right? So millennials grew up in such a super saturated psyop environment that they are as sophisticated psychological operators intuitively as like the best psyops guys in the CIA in the 70s because mm -hmm. the techniques are just. They're just the water, right? They just drink it. And the technology, you know, the mimetic technology of pr producing things that disseminate wildly throughout the world are, are off the charts, particularly now with AI kicking off. Now, with AI and deep fakes, we're going to be very close to a threshold where the mechanisms of collaborative sense making we've become used to are just going to no longer be functional. We won't be able to tell whether anything is actually real. Like a, a video from somebody, is that really from them? 
a scientific article that has pages deep of linkages and citations to completely made up documents, which an AI can produce literally instantaneously, but it may take humans weeks or months to actually get through to find out that they're bogus, by which time the attention span is assumed the truth is the, the headline is real, has lost track of the, of the underlying story and has moved on. Um, so whether it's breakdown of collective sense making and the ability to coordinate, whether it's breakdown of supply chains, whether it's breakdown of energy chains, or whether it's just straightforward kinetics, the point is this box of mutually assured destruction, more and more ways for us to fill that box have been invented. Mm -hmm. And increasingly that submarine commander is you. Mm -hmm. right? Increasingly you're empowered to have to make a choice. And increasingly it's not a choice of, a, of an affirmative push a button and everybody dies, but actually a every choice I make now has to actually be impeccable. Otherwise, the negative externalities that I'm throwing off into the world will actually lead to a collapse of this complicated system. That's the problem that Oppenheimer saw in the video that I was watching. Mm. That's what I mean by this at the end of days. We're getting to a point where our power is increasingly so high and our wisdom is so out of step with that power that at some point we'll break something that we can't fix and then a cascade effect will begin to unfold, human and natural, right? the cascade effect of people getting panicked or angry or losing hope and therefore acting in that fashion, which leads more energy in the destruction direction. Um, and we certainly have enough power then to, to end the whole thing. So that's what I mean when mm -hmm. I say that. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, and so I think your, your two forks, empire and, and kingdom, what my sense of it is, is that empire is a, like a very brief, a brief stopping point. I don't think we ended empire. I think if we head in the empire direction, there's a period of time that has a feeling of, of deep, deep constriction after which everything falls apart. Yeah. Because empires fall. Empires fall. That's critical to get. It is intrinsic to the nature. Collapse is intrinsic to the nature of empire. Just a matter of time. And the more energy and information is processing, the faster that happens. People don't really seem to get this. The reason why the Bronze Age took as long as it took is because at the end of the day, it was not metabolizing very rapidly. It was slow metabolism. Our current environment is metabolizing hyper rapidly. So it took thousands of years back then, may take, I don't know, decades or right. years. I estimated China had about 10 years uh, under the arc that it was going under. Very rough, but that's sort of just a sense of it. So. We have a double, that's a double whammy, because if we go in the empire direction, our ability to restore something like the kingdom is even harder, right? So, well, what, all right, so I, I you know, accept, and you know, I accept that hypothesis as one potential hypothesis of it, but I can also see another potential hypothesis in which, and this is not what I'm rooting for, but mm -hmm. anyway, but just to throw this out on the table is that empire actually creates a certain scaffolding of coordination within within you know state agencies and government agencies where actually this understanding that there is there is actually a level of coordination that is even beyond nationalism to a certain degree and that there are there is a, a greater level of coordination and scaffolding and then kingdom this consciousness infiltrates the scaffolding and infrastructure that empire created for top-down control because the point of empire is they're trying to control everything mm -hmm. to prevent this these, this reality that you're discussing, this end of days, and they think the only way we're going to do this is if we watch every single thing that everybody makes, we manipulate and control every narrative, yep. we get people so afraid that they're on, that we have everybody under control, we know what everybody's saying, we know what everybody's doing, we're tracking them wherever they go, we can watch everything, and we have people with, with guns and jackboots, they'll come in, they'll fucking wipe anybody out, okay, that's going to fall, it's going to, it's going to cause a problem, but it is possible I think that that actually that move is made and then still the force of kingdom that works from the inside out and starts to infiltrate and starts to actually use some of the scaffolding that empires created, but use it in a benevolent way. I don't like that reality, but I also don't want to get in a place where mm -hmm. if empire does actually pull this move off, that we're just like, all right, fu we're fucked now. Yeah, fair enough. Completely. Yeah. You know, like I, I, th like, I still um, think there's a way to like, even like, let's say you take a, take pharma or take big ag or take something. There's a way that I, I feel like it can change from the inside out. And then all of a sudden McDonald's could be the purveyor of the healthiest food on the planet because they have the distribution network yeah. that's available for it. You know, it's so 
I still have some degree of hope, but I do feel like another strategy of moving further towards kingdom and not getting to that place where we're completely restricted yeah. and clamped down is the move that we got to fight for, but we don't stop. Well, I think we can even actually make it a little bit easier, which is not like it's empire happens tomorrow and everything's hunky dory right now. We've been sitting in the midst of empire for a long time. Yes. So no matter what, we're already, we're already where you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Kingdom will be emerging in the context of empire one way or another. Right. And so actually very practically, the concerns or reservations I would have about a furthering of empire mm -hmm. would be one, they're building the wrong infrastructure. So mm -hmm. even if you actually manage to take it from within, a large part of work is going to have to be done redesigning the damn thing because it's the wrong infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, let me think. Two, we are burning non-replaceable um, resource. And I mean this both spiritually and emotionally, culturally, as well as physically. So we just sort of keep pushing ourselves to the point where things get dicier and dicier. Um, and three, there is, is of course going to be some point at which you're tipped over the top. Now, by the way, tipping over the top, again, looping back to the AA metaphor, rock bottom's rock bottom. Right? And, and it may be that it's not until the actual moment of collapse where the Things are actually really seriously, obviously, and undeniably falling off that the consciousness raises to say, okay, kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that it's actually the kingdom sort of emerges in the midst of that. What we don't know is we don't know how fast that can happen. Mm -hmm. That may be very fast. You know, I was watching how rapidly things were happening in early COVID. One of the advantages of the world, the infrastructure that we have built, right? This crazy digital thing, this social dilemma that we've built is that we actually can communicate with everybody on the planet more or less instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And all this attention that everybody are, are unhealthily pointing to the digital does mean that if a signal goes out in the digital, um, the orients attention in a certain direction, everybody can get it and kind of will. Well, and this is also why someone like RFK who's fighting against censorship or someone like Elon who goes and, and clears, you know, what's now X, formerly Twitter, <laughs> you know, from a place of censorship actually allows the free dissemination of information. And one of the problems was, is that our actual infrastructure itself was still being controlled by yes. empire in collusion with government. So government and corporate agencies, again, working together to suppress information to allow their narrative to be dominant. Yeah. And so we need places where there's free exchange and it feels like, oh shit. All right, well, we got at least one. Mm -hmm. You know, we got one way in which people can communicate. And yeah, there's going to be AI creating different shit and it's going to be confusing. The epistemic commons is, you know, that's come from, I think, the field of more your colleagues and some of my friends, this idea of like, all right, this is the place where you make sense. This is how you know what you know is the, right. it's the library of the world basically. And that's been degraded. There's a lot of other problems, but at least ideas can, can be spread freely without suppression and censorship. And so, you know, that's kind of part of what's been going on here as well is like, I think empire realizes like, oh, if like the truth can actually spread virally, mimetically in a way, this could really undermine our plans. Yes. And that's, by the way, double good news. Um, yeah. In fact, one of the things I told my friends about the 2016 Trump election was that, well, good news is we still live in a democracy. Because I, I assure you, if uh, Team Blue could have stopped that election from happening, they would have. So that means that we lived in a functional democracy, at least for a while. I don't know if we still do, but we did at the time. That's a good sign. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Same thing here. Yeah. Right? The empire, it is hard for me to imagine. I mean, people can definitely tell stories of the degree to which Elon may in fact be a double blind or captured in some way. And he probably is compromised in certain ways. He's too powerful not to have be part of the big game. But it's hard for me to imagine that the... Maybe. I, I, actually, I actually think... Everybody's maybe. compromised in some way. If you're, if you're powerful enough... But it may not be enough to matter. Yeah. yeah that's the key thing. If, you, if you're willing to just say, yeah, fuck off, go ahead, release the tapes, I don't care. Or uh, you know, d d delete five, $50 billion worth of my wealth or freeze my assets, I'm willing to go that direction. Um, then of course, you can't be, you, you, we cannot be held by false power if we're not will, allowing ourselves to be held by false power. Yeah. Um, but in any event, it's hard for me to put together a scenario where the degree to which Twitter has enabled a renaissance of communication and relatively unburdened speech, um, if they could have stopped it, which is actually a good sign because that indicates that the empire yeah. is actually reasonably not powerful, right? It's right. actually within a relatively ordinary range of, of, uh, capacity. Right. And it seems just to double click on the democracy thing. 
it seems like you got to give it. And, you know, of course I'm a huge supporter. I've gone all in for Bobby Kennedy. I know, I know him as a man, I know his heart. And it's again, one of those things where it's, yes, I agree with what he says, but I also, I love the man genuinely, Mm. like from my heart, like I love him and I've met his kids and I love his kids. Mm. It makes me emotional because it's like, this is a good man. You know, and I feel that, I feel that in every cell of my body, you know, so I get asked and I've never been political in my whole life. I haven't believed, I've never believed in anybody. I thought Obama was cool. He had a nice crossover and a, and a good like finger roll, you know, and, the, <laughs> and that, matter, that mattered a lot to me. You know, that was a symbol for me yeah. that really inspired yeah. it. He, he spoke and he was a great orator, you know, you would have made Cicero proud you know, with how he could speak. So I had some hope. It didn't pan out the way that I hoped it would, you know, way too many people getting locked up for marijuana charges and a whole bunch of Mm -hmm. personal things. I was like, come on, bro. But however, that's not the point of it. But the point is for the very first time, I've actually never even registered to vote, but I'm not only am I going to be registering to vote, I'm out there fucking giving everything I got, you know, because I I believe in this. But so this is uh, kind of a long way around and also open for any of your comments on any of that, but it's a long way around for me saying, all right, I think we're in a place where we have to agree, not have to, but most of us who are making sense of things, that there is a, there is a small or medium amount of fuckery that can happen with election machines, ballots. And it's probably, there's always been some fuckery, dead people who are voting. I mean, that's probably occurred in the fucking 1800s, right? Dead people voting, somebody coming in. Oh, for sure. So that's always been there. So what is, so, so it looks like that's probably increased. Maybe it was 1% in 1870 and 1940 was maybe 1.5 or 2%. And then by now in 2020, it feels like, all right, like, what was that? Maybe 4%, like, but, so there's some level, but still, it's still mostly democracy mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. just some, mm-hmm. some like fuzziness around, yeah. around the edges. Yeah. And is that, is that kind of how you totally see it now? Absolutely. So if I had to like pin you down and go like, all right, so what, what do you think is the, what do you think is the, is the Delta? What do you think is the margin of margin, margin of, of fuckery? fuckery? Yeah. Well, it's not evenly distributed. And so the key element is actually what's the margin of fuckery at the places that matter, the choke mm-hmm. points. It's not an average. And because the places of the matter have actually been narrowed down to a relatively small amount. Because certain say, states with certain electoral college and votes. Even, and even very specific counties and cities. Mm-hmm. So if I took it to a place like Philadelphia, probably as high as 10, 15%. Um, Maricopa County, maybe 5 or 6%. Mm-hmm. So... High enough to really matter. That's big. That's big. Because most elections are not won by percentages that are higher than that. Yeah. So that's big. And it seems like the the scary part is it seems like this is not in both directions. It doesn't seem like it seems like it seems like it's they're they're picking a candidate and applying their fucker. Because if there was actually evenly distributed fuckery where and again, I think there's a huge evolution that's needed in our red versus blue team dynamics, right? Like we have to have an Charged. independent that actually breaks this system. So yep. people are actually voting for people rather than voting for teams and, yep. and these structures. But it feels like it feels like one team is one team seems to have but I, I mean, I don't like to say that because I don't like to, I don't like to reify the team ideology. Well, the, the but thing it we can say seem... with certainty is that team blue dominates cities. Mm-hmm. No question about that. Nobody would argue about it. It's very obviously true. And we can say with confidence that it's easier to apply fuckery in cities because it's a much more complicated environment with a lot more moving parts going on. Uh, fuckery in the rural environments is harder because the people who live in those environments is population is thin enough that if you apply fucker, it's easier to tell if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Cause it's Bobby or, or Johnny or Tim or Susan or you right. know, whoever yeah. down the street, like, what are you doing? And anonymity yeah. creates a gap as it does in every case, right? If our, if our relationships are not real, they're mediated by a form of formality, that gap right there is a niche for fuckery. Almost mm-hmm. all fuckery happens in that gap. Um, and so Cities are easier to manipulate and have always been, right? The notion of political machines were invented in the big cities. There's also more resources to, to graft, to flow, um, just because they have more wealth to, to play with. 
or concentrated well. And so uh, the likelihood that Team Blue is more able to play with machinery of fuckery in the contemporary environment at the low level, like at the electoral level, is I think a pretty strong heuristic. Yep. Team Red, back in the Bush years, right, Rove and that stuff, they seem to really optimize on like aggressive mimetic warfare back mm -hmm. in the you know, late, like the late 20th and the early 21st century. Um, although I don't know the details. I'm not like sophisticated in political machinations. Sure. But let's, let's focus on RFK for a moment. Cause so here's the thing that I would say. So vis-a-vis -vis Elon and Twitter. Uh, yes. Window of opportunity. Why do we take advantage of it? Here's the challenge I think in front of us. Um, we've become so, how do I say, disempowered, mm -hmm. cynical, skeptical, but also lazy. <laughs> yeah. You're fucking lazy. My goodness. <laughs> um, and stupid. And we're not lazy. Like even the builders build, but they build stupid shit that we don't need. Yeah. Like, we don't need yet another app. Like we don't, that's not the thing to be building. Right. Um, or just get in fights online. Like where you have energy, what are you going to do? I'm just going to get, pretend like I just won a great squabble because I, you know, dunked on somebody online. So how about we be less stupid and we be less lazy and we take advantage of the fact that we don't actually need any of the legacy institutions. We don't need any of them. They're all very obsolete, very old fashioned, and very non-functional. And we could build new institutions that are radically more effective if we simply coordinated. And, and therein lies the challenge. So if we have a window of opportunity where Elon is providing us the ability to, 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 to tell the truth to each other to some meaningful extent, we should probably take advantage of that. And mm -hmm. we should build two or three backups in case Elon gets erased or he changes his mind. Um, why not, right? Good backups, well-intentioned backups. Like why not be thoughtful and, 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 uh, and functional about it? And, um, and by the way, we should be coordinating using these techniques to think about how to build a battle plan to build all the rest of the stuff. Like, too sweet right now. And here's an example. Let's take RFK. Now, come on. <laughs> in all likelihood, and this is really honest, in all likelihood, he's going to be running against Biden or maybe Newsom or whatever, perhaps Michelle Obama. And Trump from jail, right? <laughs> well, just, I mean, it, it, Trump from jail—that's a whole new game. Let's just let's just put let's that, just play yeah. the first game, which is he's he's trying to emerge from the blue team, Vis which Biden. fucking yeah. hates him, which hates him, of course. Which actually, when when it comes down to voting, like it was that voting on censoring the censorship hearing he had, yeah, he had only Republicans voting in his favor, yeah, and all Democrats voting against him. Oh, it's for pretty sure. clear that even though he's wearing the blue the blue jersey, the blue team fucking hates him. Oh yeah, well, team yeah, team. Uh, Blue Church, the way that I, I described it back in the day, Blue Church absolutely hates him. He's an apostate of the, needs to be burned at the stake sensibility. A heretic. Yeah. Um, so but let me just, let me frame it just a little bit further out. Let me just you know, put it out. I've got, I got an election. I've got a, a Trump in jail and I got a, a Biden, <laughs> you know, with, 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 what do they call it? Putting a lid on it. Biden just puts the lid on it. So we don't even know that he exists. We're Andropov, if you remember that, the, the, the Russian dude. Andropov, Biden. We're not even clear that he's still alive. Biden. And, then, <laughs> and Trump in jail, right? Yeah. So we've got, and Bobby Kennedy's running against those two, all right? Just by hypothesis. Let me set that up. Come on, guys. Really? We cannot self-organize the capacity to simply reveal the idiocy and corruption in this structure? Yeah. And, and I don't mean necessarily even winning the election. How about we run our own election? We have that election run in a fashion where it's very... Uh, very easy to prove that the votes cast were the votes cast. And we actually get enough votes cast to be able to show that, by the way, in a real, honestly, well-run election that could happen in a 48 hours in a digital environment with 0% likelihood or minuscule likelihood of falsehood, guess what? He won enough to, uh, to win, or at least won enough to be a meaningful mm -hmm. uh, horse in the race. Um, why not? Why not just completely uh, obsolete the current infrastructure? or create a higher level infrastructure that plugs down. So here's an example that I came up with this a long time ago and I pitched to Brett Weinstein back in uh, 2020, which was, I can basically have a, an optionality in this modality. So I go, okay, I will sign up to vote for RFK, but I'll, and I'll register so digitally. And so I'll, I'll be mm -hmm. verified that I have a legitimate vote and I'll put my vote in, but by Kickstarter, only if enough people actually in my district vote will, will I actually execute on that. So like the day before the actual election, we'll all get our signal back and say, Kickstarter project RFK, yes or no. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that, that, that risk, if you threw your vote away, 
if you vote for a third party, or in this case, if you, let's, yeah, just, let me just use that as the frame for now. Um, you could get completely eliminate that, where I say, okay, if everybody else agrees to vote for RFK, I do too. And if we get 51% of people actually voting, then all of us, where, you know, the, the signal goes out and says, all right, guess what? Your team just went thumbs up on RFK, so execute on your pledge to go vote for RFK in the quote-unquote official election. But by now, it's actually preordained because we've actually assembled enough people to have already won the election in a way that can be very easily proven was true. And then you can you can call the number. Hey, official infrastructure. Well, I mean, easily proven also requires some form of, and I think Elon's actually working on this, some form where we actually... We each have our unique blockchain identity. We have to have a some, digital identity. With some kind of digital identity that cannot be cannot be fucked with. Yep. And so we have to we have to have that technological advancement. So this goes back to the conversation we were talking about of like people can get uh, all up in arms about the Empire Kingdom distinction. Yes. So I'll just sort of put it very straightforwardly. A uh, high fidelity, strong digital identity is a sine qua non for any viable future, right? Kingdom mm -hmm. or empire, right? I agree. We don't want the imperial version. <laughs> right? Yes. Everybody who's worried about CBDCs or social credit scores and, you know, digital fascism, that is a good worry. That's the imperial version. There's a kingdom version over here that we can do. Highly decentralized, self-sovereign, incorruptible. That needs to happen. It needs to happen like yesterday. Yep. as soon as possible. Yep. And I don't want to wait on Elon to do it because he doesn't have the incentive landscape to do it properly. And I've seen the way he designs things. Sometimes his design choices don't map up with the way it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So I want to get there the people. Why don't the people actually say, we claim our own identity. <laughs> and, we're, and the technology for doing that, fortunately, has been largely developed so we can actually execute on it. That'd be a nice swarm, like tomorrow. How about we initiate a swarm tomorrow for everybody to just say, yeah, that version of decentralized Digital identity, I, I'm in. I'll sign up for it. And by the way, if, I, if I'm not good, if, if the version that's out there that we say, like, that's the one we should do, isn't good enough, list the design changes that need to happen for you to be ready to go so we can all collaboratively do an open source project and pop it over to the threshold where it needs to be. So in the period of, I don't know, a couple months, this giant collective intelligence known as humanity can actually build the infrastructure at the very bottom of the social stack, digital identity, and have it owned by the people themselves and not by anybody else. That'd be a very powerful thing for us to do. Essential. And then, then you could use that to then put pressure on the official election machine. Really to, fucking powerful. To say like, all right, all of these, all of these false votes, you know, like, and then, and then find some kind of transparent system where your digital identity is registered yep. and like you actually, it can actually be kind of reviewed yep. in a way so that actually there is fidelity. And you know about the ZK snarks, right? I don't. So this is very important, new, relatively new. I mean, the crypto community, it's relatively old, but that's like two years old or so. So this is a, a zero knowledge proofs. So what it does is it gives you the ability to say, uh, let's say, for example, you want to be able to query whether or not I have the right to vote in this particular election. And I want to be able to prove to you that I have the right to vote in this particular election, but I don't want to tell you who I am or anything about me. Mm -hmm. right? A zero knowledge proof is a technology that now exists and is very well established, designed and are being implemented that allow us to do that. Right, so I, I can show up at the polling booth digitally or physically, and I can essentially give you a proof that I absolutely have the right to vote in this election, haven't voted before, and I'm a real human, and whatever, you're, all the stuff we want, and, 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 but nothing else. Right? So perfect privacy, but perfect fidelity and transparency on the elements that matter. Mm. And I'll give you an example of where this can be very useful. Uh, this can help us kind of slice the Gordian knot that's got old Jordan Peterson wrapped up around uh, pseudo and anonymous identities on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, Elon can have his cake and eat it too. You can use zero knowledge proofs where I come in and I establish in some fashion and many different ways of doing it. That for example, I'm a, a real live human and I'm not a bot. Mm -hmm. um, and then I can use a zero knowledge proof to tell Twitter, yep, real human, not a bot. I can even get deeper identity. You know, if Twitter asks me to say, who are you? Like what actual human are you? Or verify that you're an American, whatever it is, I can issue proofs of those specific elements and no more. Mm. So it allows me mm. to have very powerful capacity to control the particulars of my identity and prove things, again, cryptographically for like for real, um, but without revealing anything else. And so the technology for doing that, A, 
exists, has been, has been implemented, is available to be delivered at scale, and can be done in an entirely decentralized fashion. So we can have, you can have your anons, and you can avoid the, uh, what did you call them, internet troll demons? Mm -hmm. like, you can have both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and it's ready, right? It's just a matter of us getting the right consciousness and awareness and beginning to move into this 24th century form of coordination that has been such a slow start to actually just beginning to make it happen without having either venture capital money funding it or some, you know, uh, oligarch deciding they're going to uh, lightning bolt it into happening. It's, yeah, I mean, I love that idea. I, I mean, and, and of course I'm all for it. I'm all in, <laughs> like I'm fucking all in. Nice. It seems to me though, that the way, the, the only way that I can play that story where it makes sense is in this story where, I, I don't know, I, maybe this is just my lack of faith in our, maybe because of our laziness, maybe because of a variety of our inability to self-organize so far at this yeah. level of consciousness that we're at and the necessity that we get to this state ASAP, and as in ASAP, even prior to this next election, ASAP, like really fast. Well, prior to this conversation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're way behind. We're, we're way behind. Like, so it would be highly helpful if, you know, Elon is, I really actually, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know Elon. So I don't have the same relationship that I have with Bobby where I like, because I know a lot when I look in someone's eyes and I feel their energy and mm. you can call that all woo woo and whatever, but I, I have a... a you know, the anthro ontology, that feeling like through my body, I envision God. Like I, I have a sense, I can feel somebody. I, I haven't felt Elon, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he's complicated. I'm sure he is. I'm sure he's fucking complicated. However, it seems to me that if he made that move, it could get the critical mass and momentum together. And then it also clean up the Twitter infrastructure. Cause right now Twitter still has enormous amount of bot pressure that could be controlled by Russia or China oh, or, no non, or non yeah. completely non-state, just disruptive, you know, kind of whatever. There's a, a whole bunch of different ways that people can weaponize bots in this way. But if you had this, put into the Twitter in the Twitter or X atmosphere, then it can get enough critical mass. And yep. then he has a proclivity that he's shown to open source this tech. You know, I mean, he's shown that with Tesla, he's shown that with actually even open sourcing the algorithms and yep. a variety of different things. It seems like that would be the fastest move. Oh, it'd be by far the best. That's not, no, no, no ifs, ands, or buts. So from, from, from your lips to Elon's ears. Yeah. If Elon were to implement a properly designed digital identity infrastructure, right? decentralized, that Twitter is the first client on top of a decentralized infrastructure, it would be the best thing. By, by like literally the most important best thing that could happen in the world right now would be that, as far as I can tell. Uh -huh. um, and by the way, he could. So the only question is, will he? <laughs> Let's go, <you> want? <laughs> come on, bro. <laughs> how, might, how, might, how might we uh, uh, kind of cause him to decide have help him decide for his own purposes in the only way in his own way of understanding reality that it is actually the right thing to do um and as far as that goes i have no idea i'd be willing to bet if let's say let's say here i get i get to put on my you know prophecy hat mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, which which has no credibility because i'm not a prophet <laughs> so no credibility there for me but if i had to just sense i have a sense he's going to do it nice I have a sense that he's he's going to do it, and and I have my closest like I know people who know Kimball pretty well, and Kimball and Elon still have a pretty good relationship as far as brothers go, and I have this kind of sense that there's this consciousness that's at least close and surrounding the enigma that is that is Elon, you know, that I have no personal knowledge about, but just a kind of sense of things by watching him, and a sense of things by the people who know the people close to mm -hmm. him that I trust, the people that I can have that relationship with, oh, I trust you. Like, I trust you to actually read, you know, the people that are close to him. That's what gives me the confidence that he's actually going to do it. So if I, if I was going to put my money down and there was a big Vegas bookie that came in and said, all right, put your money where your mouth is, here's your odds, you know, will you place a, will you place a six-figure bet on this? I would place it. Wow. Well, it is my understanding, and I'm, I'm no expert on this fashion, but uh, the notion of whether you're a prophet or not is God's choice, not yours. <laughs> right. And I expect that if you find yourself called to prophecy, you'd accept that, that vocation. 
So if yeah. uh, Elon calls you to the king's chambers, <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to have to be Daniel in this particular circumstance. Yeah. And uh, that might be very helpful, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, if, if, and one of the, so one of the tools that I've been developing, so my field of expertise and my field of, you know, if I dare use the word mastery, which mastery is always the perpetual recognition of being a student mm -hmm. in pursuit mm -hmm. of mastery. A master never actually calls themselves a master because the more you understand, the more you realize that there is to understand, right? So my, my pursuit of mastery has been in the field of psychonautics and psychedelic medicine. 24 years, mm -hmm. I've been diligently following the path, learning from the masters, the lineage holders of the Shipibo, of the Shavin, of the Buiti, and then also including all of that and transcending it into a kind of a global understanding of how we can interact with these sacred medicines, whether they're, whether they're synthetic or whether they're plant-based. I think a lot of times people have a knee-jerk reaction to only the plants are good and only all synthetics are bad. Mm. And I think we have to get beyond that and understand that we're interacting, all both of these things are interacting with our own consciousness in a particular way. And they reliably, and there's been studies from Johns Hopkins and a variety of things that allow people to access a spiritual dimension, a field of a felt sense of the divine or a felt sense of the good or a felt sense of an ethos that actually can almost bind them in a certain way because you have access to it. I know for me, if I've done even the slightest shitty thing to a person, if I've fucked someone in the slightest way, even unconsciously, ayahuasca will bring that mm. right to my face and I'll have to look <laughs> right at it. And it will not let me, not let me go yep. until I go and I make that call and I make that text. And I can't tell you how many times, you know, that's happened where I thought I was like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm really acting in the best way, but shit, I missed this one. I hurt this person's feelings. Or I was just spinning the cue ball a little much, little bit too much here yep. for my own advantage. And yep. so it'll call me to that and also radically open my heart and open my, you know. So one of the things that's happening that also gives me hope is I think these technologies when used appropriately. Now, this is not to say that there are not a lot of different, you know, off ramps into fields of what you would call luciferic inflation and fields of delusion and fields mm -hmm. of kind of um, really challenging areas. It's not a panacea. It's not universally applied with universal success. But as a generality, it's part of what's opening up these new levels of consciousness that are necessary. So for example, you know, like my wife and I have developed our own facilitation that we've started to spread to key allies in what I would call the golden kingdom, which is just a metaphor for the good kingdom. Mm. And in the golden kingdom, trying to reach these key allies and in introducing them to a variety of different medicines, some like the ayahuasca traditions that I am incapable of facilitating, nor mm. would I endeavor mm -hmm. to do so. It requires a, both a lineage and a deep, deep you know, commitment to that particular path. But we've developed our own path that has been wildly profound and being able to open this up. And we call this our particular lineage that's developed 22 years after I've been on the path learning from all the medicines, we've created our own lineage and we call that lineage the God bomb, which is the an interesting thing. If there's a bomb like the H bomb that mm. can actually destroy, this is a bomb that can actually blow up all the false constructs within yourself and allow mm. you to access something that emerges from the heart and gives you clarity of mind, the clear light, the light that illuminates the truth without actually distorting it in any way. And so if Elon, you know, gets word from these different people who've gone through this and say, all right, Aubrey, I'm into it. Mm. Oh, cool. Of course. Of course. Of course. Like here we are, you know, Vailana will show up with her sound bowls. You know, I was like, you're going to need a bodywork table. And I've apprenticed in a particular type of bodywork. <laughs> and we know, you know we know, we know the, the medicine stack. And, I've heard and we'll the God that. bomb is the best first step in any training for MMA style combat. <laughs> Just well, putting it out there. Just putting it out there. If you don't want to get your ass kicked on national television by little well, Mark Zuckerberg, maybe you should take the, the God bomb first. <laughs> yeah, get, get, a, get him in there. <laughs> the irony of that is there has been many, many high performing athletes who, you know, some have been willing to share some of these experiences well, I've had. Makes sense to me. You know, UFC fighter TJ Dillashaw. It wasn't the God bomb, but I led him through actually a DMT ceremony. And this was 
where he was actually able to, and this was just, it was limited to his sport. Also, it opened up a lot of things, but he was able to see himself winning the championship so visibly and so clearly, and then through a variety of different injuries and whatever, got an immediate title shot against Henan Burrell, where he was like a nine to one underdog, mm. but had seen something so clearly that he was able to be victorious. Now, how much did that ceremony contribute to that? I don't know, but the felt sense where he felt himself as champion gave him a certain level of confidence and so much of competition is confidence. So it, we, you were kind of joking there and kind of baiting Elon <laughs> in, into this, into this. But I, but I also think that, you know, it, ha, it does have universal effects where it can universally allow you to perform at the highest level. Like, let's not forget that in this 24, year journey with psychedelic medicine and all psychonautic practices, which include darkness retreats and darkness therapy, includes, you know, breath work, includes sensory deprivation tanks, includes ecstatic dance, includes all of these other factors, includes even meditative practices, vipassanas, all of these different things. These have a universal ability to allow you to perform at a highest level. Because during that period, I mean, we're talking, you know, 11 years in, I start a company called On It and then successfully build and exit that company with a big nine figure exit. So if you're talking about that game and you're talking about performance, the medicine work that I did was invaluable mm -hmm. in allowing me to perform at that level. And it's not like I had a huge head start. I was able to scrape together $110,000 from two friends mm. and we grew on it from that nut and no particular, you know, obviously I had a great partner in that business too. And you can you say that Joe Rogan is like an enormously powerful partner, but it wasn't with, and that partnership wasn't because he was my family friend or whatever. It's because I sought him out as a friend. We made a friendship and an alliance and we built something together on basically a handshake with a little bit of money and succeeded in performing in the games, in the game metric that, that we we're actually playing in and all of the other spiritual dimensions were accessed as well. So there's so much, I think, possible in the right relational use of these psychonautic practices. And I think that's a big ally that's, we're all aware of it, but it's still actually being under indexed mm. as far as the potential value that it can offer to the world. Yeah, well, I'm gonna say that another piece, which is um, like, if I, if I look back to the history of it back in the, the 60s, I would have first really kind of burst onto the scene. It's, 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 it's sort of can be too easily captured by false power as well. Yeah. So the technology of being able, I think I'm, I, I personally can say that I feel like it connects you to true power and it can pop you through the false symbols, shed the false symbols, as you say, should put you face to face with atonement. Yeah. Not all of them, but some of them. You have wronged somebody, and guess what? You know, you're going to suffer that experience and by living it directly. And you have an opportunity to really f grow enough internally to be able to go forward and f fix things in reality. Atonement, also another beautiful way to look at this, just to play on words, is at one minute, mm -hmm. which is recognize it's collapsing the myth of separation and realizing that you can't fuck somebody over without fucking yourself over because it's you living a different life. Yeah, you, so, you, you, you stepped on somebody's toes and it was your own. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and yet the sort of the, the adversarial forces of false power have long ago figured out how to play with these tools as well mm -hmm. and lure people. So just in that same sensibility of like infinitesimal courage and that notion of spiritual warfare, the carefulness of, and you said it just right, actually, you said it perfectly, which is that you actually haven't got proper permission to take people through an ayahuasca journey because no. that requires a certain level of let's say responsibility mm -hmm. and a certain level of having been called properly to do so. Correct. So I think if we can raise that element, like raise the level of carefulness, by the way, the word sacred, right? That word sacred, I think is just right. You know, ultimate concern for that, which, which is or ultimate care for the ultimate concern. Mm -hmm. So the more powerful something is, the more careful we need to be, the more we can and should use the technologies, the techniques of sacredness. Mm -hmm. And this is okay. That thing right there, very powerful. Therefore, treat it with care. Treat it as sacred. What does that mean? Well, you can't take people through it because you haven't been called to properly. Yep. These individuals have gone through the suffering and the growth and the intimacy. And by the way, they're just a straightforward calling. 
right? It's actually their responsibility in the universe to do it. Great. Let them go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if we can mature, by we I'm speaking now for the people who participated in this aspect of the story, to the point where we had that level of care and we sort of re-bring in that level of the sacred, then yeah, I think these technologies, I'm certain these technologies are necessary. I really agree with that. And I think like, a lot of people have uh, have this kind of idea that it's cheating if you're using if you're using these technologies. Like mm-hmm. the real way is to spend twenty years in a monastery and meditating. No, that's a way. It's a beautiful way. However, the way that our lives are moving so quickly and so fast, to expect or imagine that somebody is going to endeavor to go along that path, which is going to have very small incremental effect over time applied. And and I'm not saying people shouldn't do that, you know, of course, mad blessings. But what people look at as like as cheating or some bad version of a shortcut is like, no, 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 this is actually a necessary shortcut. This is a necessary way that we can move and evolve faster, fast enough to meet the demands of what's being called forward from our consciousness to actually abide in a new state of a new story. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I truly feel that these, these psycho technologies are actually really necessary at this point and they have to be wielded with ultimate care. Ultimate care. Yeah, I think if we can, um, yeah, just like any other sacred object, it's, it's necessary. And ultimate care. It's, not, it's yeah. easy to say. It's hard to do. Yeah. But if we can do it, then, you know, muscle tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have, an, you have an idea that, uh, that I want to unpack a little bit. And um, I believe the term you use is civium. Yeah. And it's like, it's, and, and I'd like you to explain that. But from my understanding, it's the idea that these, the kingdom will birth from an actual place in a way that like actual, that there's actually a home. Mm. a home from which this this flowers and actually if not only just a digital home but a physical home but i don't understand your i don't understand so i don't want to yeah i don't want to explain something that is your your kind of concept here so it it actually came out of a um a scientific insight that then i began to extrapolate wildly so i'll begin with the scientist jeffrey west and his insight, or the group that he was working with, and their insight, which has to do with the uh, the unusual occurrence of of exponential curves in cities that you don't see anywhere else in nature. And I'm going to caveat a little bit because social networks have the same kind of curves. So what Jeffrey and his team were doing is they were looking at uh, scaling laws throughout nature, and what they found was that for the most part, systems either scale linearly, like just you know, you just add more grains of sand to a pile and it gets heavier linearly, or they scale with a sublinear scaling factor, which is metabolic, uh, is, the, is the archetype. So if I double the weight of a mammal, for example, I increase its metabolic rate by only 0.85. I don't double it, which mm. means that if I have an elephant compared to a mouse, its mass is, let's say, 10,000 times as high, but its metabolic rate is only, say, 100 times as high. I'm mm-hmm. not having done the math recently. Uh, and so it has a look of an asymptotic curve. Right? The metabolic rate tends to be approaching, not going up anymore. If, if you could mm. imagine, it's not physically possible. If you could imagine a mammal that was mass like a quadrillion pounds, its metabolic rate would actually look like it's flattened out in relationship to other animals on that curve. And then notice this was happening in uh, trees, branches on trees, leaves on trees, but also forests, ecosystems, ecosystems cross species of everywhere. Uh, corporations too, by the way. And so when you're saying metabolic, you're talking about the demand on external resources to actually sustain it. Yeah, the amount of energy per unit mass. Yep. And um, so it becomes more efficient, a more efficient use of energy for the same for the for the mass that it's using. Uh, corporations have a similar curve with regard to wealth per employee. So it also tends to asymptote. When they went and took a look at cities, what they discovered is the cities had a very similar dynamic for lots of infrastructure, like roads per capita, length of roads, or lengths of utility lines, sewer lines, things that are kind of like metabolic. But then they discovered this other curve with things like wealth per capita, innovation per capita, which was on a completely different curve, an exponential curve that they'd never seen anywhere. So what they found is that if you double the size of a city population, the wealth per capita 
goes up by 15%, which of course means the growth, the gross wealth goes up by a lot more because you've doubled the number of people and increased the wealth per capita. Mm -hmm. The innovation per capita also goes up by 15%. And it doesn't take many doublings. If you're going from, say, a 100-person village up to a million-person city, that's actually a very big gap, a very big difference in wealth per capita. And, okay, so that's the end of the, of the real science. Now it's my, my extrapolations. The, the, the extrapolation that I looked at when I spent time with it, and it's been about a decade that I've been looking at that, was that's the generator of civilization. Like, that's the driver. That the simplicity is something like there's a vortex or a, a centripetal attractor that wants to put as many human beings as possible into the same city. Because if you put more people into the same city, you increase wealth and innovation by, in, on an exponential curve. And there are things that wealth and innovation produce that are attractive. So it's self-perpetuating. That attraction attracts more people. As more people come in, you increase the wealth and innovation exponentially, so the attractor gets stronger. And so that's, that's the, the attractive force. Apologies. But there's also a, a repulsive force, which is that as you put more people into cities, you've got more bodies that are living in the same physical space. And that becomes a, a, an entropic or energetic problem to solve. I have to have places to put those bodies. I've got to find a way to get enough food to feed them. Uh, water, I've got to be able to remove their waste. Right? This is a whole bunch of problematics. So the history of city is the history of these two forces fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. If our innovation says, okay, we have enough wealth and innovation to suddenly build like concrete houses that are five stories high, we can build Rome. Uh, we can build aqueducts to bring water in from way far away so we can put a million people into a single urban environment. And the wealth and innovation that comes out of that can innovate roads that can build out. And I would propose, by the way, that all of civilization is simply the extended body of that, of the city. Mm -hmm. So all of Rome, the entire Roman empire, is effectively the territory of Rome itself. Mm. And the word territory I'm using as a term of art, which is that one of the things that city does is it territorializes, meaning it takes a piece of, of complex reality, land, and converts it into a use. So now it's become agricultural land. Right? It makes it subject to a human purpose that makes it complicated, to use the previous language. So every empire, empire is a civilization of this sort and is ultimately grounded on the logic of squeezing as many bodies as possible into urban environments, and ideally all into one city if you can get it. Okay, now, why is that? What's happening at the boundary there? Um, my hypothesis, the next hypothesis, is that ultimately what we're seeing is Metcalfe's law. We're seeing the fact that there's something that happens in what I call the anti-rivalrous domain when minds are able to communicate. Mm -hmm. right? We're able to actually create a greater mind by communicating with each other that is the essence of this exponential. And that the city is actually just an artifact of the fact that up until relatively recently, communication has been bound to physical proximity. And in this case, we're living it. I, I didn't do this via, via Zoom. We, I, I'm talking to you in real life. Um, for obvious reasons. I get a lot of bandwidth in physical bodies. Yeah. I, I can read your body language. I can detect your pheromones. There's shit going on that I can't convey to you in an epistle mm -hmm. or in a telegraph or a phone call. And so the bandwidth of communication in physical person is very high. Mm. So we need to get those bodies into the same place. But the real thing we're trying to do is trying to get minds into collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that's the exponential driver. All right, all that's backstory. What we've seen in the same moment that we've had these technologies and efforts to be able to figure out how to solve the problem of embodied conurbation, including by the way, transportation, is we've also seen a development of the technologies of communication that it ephemeralizes the body. Writing being the primary first example. So I can read Nietzsche. I don't even have to meet him. Mm. He's long dead. And uh, science can happen because I can publish a scientific study. Somebody can read it and they can publish another study that has different results. Right. We can communicate without being in the same place. And of course, we now live in a context where everybody who's watching this video, while they are not in this room, can participate in this conversation in a fashion that's not that different from being an audience sitting in the same room with things like Apple and these XR goggles and whatnot, we're crossing a threshold where the binding between collaborative minds and bodies being in the same space is being broken. And so this now gives rise to a very profound, from my point of view, shift in the underlying driver that has been driving civilization for 10,000 years, maybe longer. 
Mm -hmm. you know, I have a deeper story of the kind of the Dunbar problem and how you actually solve for the, the shift from indigenous Dunbar level constructs into things that can connect with this city driver, but we'll ignore that for the moment. So the hypothesis is that simply as a consequence of the fact that we've actually reached this tipping point, we're on the other side of something, or shortly will be, where this volcanic driver at the center that's been ultimately whipping us around its axis for 10,000 years is no longer at the center. And human beings are, are suddenly, it's like somebody turned off gravity in the middle of the uh, solar system. We're all floating around going, okay, which direction do we go now? Mm. Right, so now here's the Cydium hypothesis. Um, and I'm actually gonna do this hypothesis through the lens of Metcalfe's law. And so the hypothesis is that on one side of the, of the, uh, the, the looking glass, one side of the eye of the needle, the dominant driver has been metric. It has been quantity. Uh, Metcalfe's law is purely quantitative. The more human beings I add to a communications network, the more valuable that communication network becomes. Mm -hmm. Just numbers, add more people. It doesn't matter anything about the quality of the people or the quality of the relationships, just their raw number. That's how it's measured. And this drove things like big cities and things like social media, say Facebook and Twitter, and just throw more people in. Now here's the logic. The logic is that what Metcalfe's law really describes is the possibility of communication, which if you think about it, is exactly what it's describing. Mm -hmm. If I have a whole bunch of people on a telephone network, I've increased the possi possible number of conversations I could have, which is how def they originally defined value of the network. But there's two more me metrics. There's the actual potential conversations, which is a whole process. It's selecting from the possible the actual ones that I might encounter. A whole other set of filters on that. That's what the algorithm does. And then I have the actual conversations and what value I get out of them, right? So those are three steps. So the hypothesis is this something like, for a long time, metrics dominate. And I would say, by the way, thematically, civilization is a metric dominated characteristic. Lots of things like money is a metric, right? Decontextualizes things from their relational context and produces something where you can just make number go up. And that means good. Mm. And it makes it very simple, very tractable. But past a certain threshold, um, increasing possibility doesn't really get you anywhere. Right? We live in an environment now where the gating item on my experience of the networks that I'm enmeshed in is not the number of people who are on the network. It's my attention. Mm -hmm. It's the amount of my time that I can spend, the conversations I can have. Should I be talking with you or should I be talking with somebody else right now in this moment? Mm -hmm. But find that amount of possibility. So the possibility is now gated by something which is, cannot be addressed by adding more people to the top of the funnel. What it can be addressed by is increasing the quality of the funnel that comes all the way down, which is to increase the actuality of the conversations that I'm having. That's a very different thing. That's a qualitative thing. So we're shifting from the moment of the quantitative to the qualitative. And let's take this back to the notion of cities. The cities were dominated by the quantitative. It doesn't matter the quality of life. It doesn't even matter the quality of people at the end of the day. Just throw more right. bodies into the city. This, by the way, was the finding they were finding at the Santa Fe Institute and Jeffrey West. Didn't matter whether you were talking about medieval Japan or talking about 20th century Iran. The numbers were still double the number of people, N, and increase wealth and innovation. So the argument that I make in the Civium construct is now that we have decoupled these two dynamics, we have both an opportunity and a strategic advantage by orienting towards quality in both directions. This is what mm -hmm, I mean. Mm -hmm. Move the bodies into a context which is actually designed to increase the quality of life of the human body, the embodied human, right? Back into a more indigenous context, right? back into the, many of the things we talked about earlier, back into real relationships with human beings that you care about and they care about you. Back to real relationships, with the natural environment where you can care for it and it can care for you. I don't know about you, but I've actually discovered in my life first person that memory lives in places. Mm. That if you live in a place for a long enough time and you go away and you come back, you're like, oh shit. Like, it's not that it inspires memories in me, but the memory is in the place itself. Yeah, they're in the rocks and it's the walls in the rocks, and the trees, yeah. yeah. And just imagine for a moment the possibility of what it would be like to grow up in a place that your father and grandfather grew up in. And in that magical period of your childhood, the sacredness that is only available during that period of time was stewarded by people who remembered that magic and had cared for the place at the mm -hmm. level of sacredness that is appropriate to those magical places and moments like the tree or the, the rock, the swing into the river, right? Yeah. Or the, I mean, I'm here in Texas, so I have lots of Texas memories. 
And it wasn't, by the way, predated by individuals or entities that didn't care, right? That, that it was not profane, but held sacred. And that you could then grow up as an individual in relationship with that place to steward it for your, your child and your grandchild, yeah? Just imagine what that does to your heart and your feeling of wholesomeness and meaningfulness and connectedness and the quality of the kind of human being you would be and how that would nurture your capacity to care for anything else. If you can care for the place that you're in at that level, you can care for the people you're around and for your actions in the world. Like it's just a, a different way of having agency, you know, a hill to die on, that kind right. of thing. All right. And of course, imagine in that same environment that everybody else around you had a similar relationship and therefore, by the way, also had a lot of skin in the game with each other. Right? No more, ah, fuck them. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. No, no, that guy's going to be here in this place. His kids are going to be with my kids. We need to take responsibility for that person. We need to care for each other, really. And it's just that, that basic, again, indigenous sensibility, which is the sensibility that we are naturally afforded in a tuned capacity to thrive in right? as humans, as biological humans, the biological beast. All right. That's one side. Now imagine if that's how we were actually able to construct our environment. We're no longer being bound by the, the inhuman attractive, just throwing our bodies into the urban environment so we can tap into that wealth and into that innovation. But we can access that same wealth and innovation, but now in the virtual realm and use our bodies can have access to this entirely new qualitative experience and become nurtured and whole. Now imagine what those human beings are able to uh, achieve in their conversations and collaborations with other nurtured and whole people in the virtual. <clears throat> so this is the, you know, the internet 1.0 hope. And this is what happens when we encounter each other in the virtual, but we're whole humans, right? we're mature humans. We understand how to communicate. We understand not how to take things personally. We have an ethos of, of how to actually operate properly. By the way, a lot of that is as a result of touching grass for real, right? Knowing the consequences sure. of your actions in reality um, and knowing how to treat other people properly, right? It's so weird being at, at this age, encountering young people who've never actually been in relationships where treating other people properly was part of their natural environment. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You could just fuck people off and call a duty with your headphones and yeah. nobody punches you in the face for being an asshole, then you don't learn how not to be an asshole. Right. Um, but if you actually had to grow up with the same group of kids in the same area, you may have had some, some negative consequences because the culture you're in is, you know, 10,000 years of catastrophe. We've got all kinds of, of, of ancestral and lineage trauma that we got to deal with, but you would have learned how not to be an asshole with the people you were going to be friends with. All right. So let's imagine we have human beings who are whole, wholesome, noble human beings now connecting in the virtual. And then finally, last piece, that notion of treating the virtual sacredly, right? treating the virtual with the level of care that it actually needs to have. Thinking about how do we design digital identity from the point of view of the good kingdom, not from the point of view of the empire. And empowering the individuals who are called to do that. Right? The same folks who, you know, back in our archetypes of like the Steve Jobs era, like the, the technologists who were called to build that infrastructure, but vocationally, right? like the mason who builds the cathedral. Uh, you're building something that is deeply, deeply powerful. Treat it with sacred care and design it so that it is actually constructed such that people are not incentivized or empowered to engage in sociopathic manipulation of each other. This is not a hard thing to do. I just described that we can do this with digital identity. Many people actually have some basic idea of how to do it. Some people actually know how to do it pretty well. We just don't currently resource and empower them to design the things that their heart knows and their mind knows is necessary. But let's imagine that you did that. Right? You design well, I mean, I, I don't have to imagine it because in some way in from just following my own impulse, I've cr started to create something that very much aligns with this. It's, you know, 2018, I started, uh, started this group we called Fit for Service. Mm. And this came from my teacher, Don Howard, you know, who was who spoke, you know, simple wisdom. He's like my spiritual grandfather. And he said, in order to be of service, you have to become fit for service. So it was actually a very simple ethos that bound it, that you actually train yourself, initiate yourself to a level of fitness, both physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, psychologically, socially. And you expand and develop this level of fitness for the purpose of service of the greater whole. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's smaller aspects of the ethos that goes in, but that's the driving principle behind it. And so, 
we have in-person gatherings at, in, sacred, in sacred places. And we have some places that I steward, one place in Lockhart, one place in Sedona. Mm. And we actually gather in person. And in person, people get to know each other. And then we'll do a survey. So of course, we have people have powerful experiences, but they get this felt sense of meeting a stranger who's not really a stranger because they're bound by this common ethos. And then we'll do a survey and we'll ask, all right, how many of you made a lifelong friend through this process? It's like close to 100% yeah. of people made a lifelong friend. And then, all right, well, how many people started a new business venture with one of the other members that you met? Like 40, 40 some percent, which is showing some of what you're saying about yeah. when you gather together, then there's value across the board. Yeah. And so this is happening. And now, you know, people have gone through different programs and you get lifetime access to a digital environment that we created, the Fit for Service app that has now thousands of people who've gone through the program. Maybe they just went to one event or maybe they went to many a year long program or however they did it. But now they have access to communicate and talk to each other in this group. And it's, it's actually shown that, oh, wow, like we're seeing across the board, whether it's relationship, whether it's finance, whether it's, you know, spiritual growth or yep. actualization, or whether it's friendship or, you know, people seeing this massive benefit and also in the tangible places, because for four years, you know, for a few years now, there's been the Lockhart kind of stronghold and there's been the Sedona stronghold, which is not only used for fit for service, but also my own gatherings. And I was recently at a gathering where a uh, men's group was using the my Sedona kind of temple, if you wanted to call it, like the Temple of Sedona. What was beautiful is none of them had ever been there, but when they walked in, they go, wow, this place is special. Mm. There's been some special things that have mm -hmm. happened here because they could see the care. You know, they could see that like on every, in every walkway and in every path, there was the right tree that was planted and the right thing that was stewarded over these 10 years. And they had just this felt sense and they're currently there going through their own, going through their own process. But we met them there on the first day to kind of introduce them because this is our, this is the sacred for us, mm -hmm. you know, but we trust them and then got to introduce ourselves to them. So also increase this kind of connectivity between myself as a representative of all the circles that I know meeting this circle and now knowing that it has this kind of one extra circle in this flower of life pattern, which is what I would call the golden web. Again, going to this golden kingdom, golden web. I'm using gold as this just analogy of, of how it goes, being that yellow light energy of coming from the sun, all everything, all of us underneath and bound by the common sun, which loves and warms everyone universally. And so there's metaphorical ideas, stories that come from it, but whatever, it's just what I call it. But I can feel it. I can feel how powerful that is. And then how within that you organize the circles of the flower of life. My, I have my own closest Ohana, which is represented by this ritual practice of bead exchange and vow exchange, where you're agreeing to a common ethos. And you're saying like, I'll be, I'll be there for you. And whatever fight you have, like you're not going to fight alone, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And in my tough times, you know, in my dark times, I wear this necklace of all the beads. I'm not wearing it today on many podcasts I do, but like, I'll actually just go through and I'll be like, you know what? I'm not alone. Cause I know, I know why will fight for me. And I know Sean will fight for me. I know Eric will and Kyle will and Caitlin will and Vi will and Alana will and I'll, and Soraya will and Blue will. And I'll go through all of these and I'll be like, they're here with me. You know, they're always here with me. And so there's, you know, circles within circles, which again is an, is an empire ideology as well. This is how we think that the, the negative power structure is organized, but there's the kingdom version of that as well, which seems to very much correlate with this Civium concept where there's mm -hmm. physical locations, but then digital communication, because we're not always going to all be able to move into a conscious community and deal with the locational dynamics. Not, now, when it can happen, that's super powerful, it's yeah. super potent when it can happen. And we should try to do that as much as possible, but then also use the digital environment and then gather in these sacred places, yeah. these places where we can go. And so it's just interesting that we've kind of arrived at sim in so in so many ways in this whole conversation. Again, we don't know each other, nor have we deeply studied each other's work in particular. Yeah. You know, I think it was a couple strong recommendations from a couple of our mutual friends. It was like, yeah, you guys should have this conversation. But we're arriving to these similar ideas in a way and, uh, and recognizing that this is part of the necessity of how we move forward. 
Yeah, well, this is the impossibility. You know, the good news is that the, the, the hold, the unconscious hold, by, again, by my argument, of this thing that has been just so powerful, it's not there anymore. And so we have a, we have a possibility. And now we also have a necessity. And I like the, the dimensionality, meaning that there's one direction is the rootedness direction. If you can find these communities that are whole, whole, I mean, you're going to be, your body's going to be somewhere. Yep. And if you're raising kids, you're raising them somewhere. Yep. So to, to the degree to which you can bring it to a place where you feel good about that yep. and you can start taking responsibility for the place you're at, you should. Yes. <clears throat> and by the way, that can be anywhere. It may be beautiful North Shore of Kauai, it may be Sedona, it may be a, you know, a, a city, like in the middle of a city block. I remember a, an old professor I had. He was old when I had him as a professor. I'm sure he's passed away years ago. He grew up in, uh, in Brooklyn, I think, in beginning of the 20th century. And he talked about block consciousness. Right? Mm -hmm. He grew up, there was a block. That was his block. Mm -hmm. and if you went to the next block, it was somebody else's block. And he was, he was Irish. It was an Irish block. It was like the Italians on the other block. And guess what? You cared for your block. Right? That territory was the local place and there was people. And you know the grandmother over there was a sacred grandmother. And nobody messed with her situation, that kind of thing. So fine. Anywhere it can be taken care of. And then the second dimension is this sort of like the notion of the sacred spaces or the notion of... Um, gatherings. Yeah. And very powerful. This is powerful both because it can become a, uh, a seed that gives rise to the first kind, meaning a group may come together and say, Hey, we're all going to do this together. But even more powerfully, it creates these orthogonal linkages that, that we're going to need, right? It's no good if the two blocks go to war with each other. Yeah. What we, we can't want have is, those rivalrous tribalism. Exactly. We want, we want context. like the warrior Kings on each of the blocks to actually be part of a safer gathering over here and their brothers. Yeah. And they're bringing the energy back and saying, we are, we're not rivalrous, we're anti-rivalrous. We're intrinsically collaborative with each other. This is the sacred uh, narrative. This is the story that I'm bringing back from this adventure. Mm -hmm. And then last thing is that virtual layer, right? The virtual layer of serendipity, right? Here's the, the good algorithm. Right? The algorithm doesn't have to be orienting us towards conflict and towards maximizing sociopathic engagement. The algorithm can be tuned to make sure that the, my interests of having the best possible joyful enriching encounters are perfectly conjoined with the interests of the whole, which are me encountering the people where our conversations are the best conversations for everybody. Yeah. Right? Those, two, those two vectors can be the defining characteristics of the algorithm. And now the virtual is servicing the things that are beyond my event horizon. Mm -hmm. right? I know who in my neighborhood I should be interacting with. If I'm called into a sacred gathering, obviously that's got its own process. And then I have this third, all right, there's 8 billion people, 10 billion by the end of this story, in this field, this planetary wholeness that we're in. Who should I be talking to about what? In the virtual field, mm -hmm. right? If we have an algorithm that is actually endeavoring to maximize the, I'm thinking Spinoza here, by the way, the conatus of those encounters, then we're good, right? And, and the beauty is all the way back down. This is very practical. We're talking about a shift from the quantitative to the qualitative. And we're just talking about the dimensionalities, what it looks mm -hmm. like to be taking care of the qualitative and all the power, the beauty, the actual, oh, this is the actual life I'm having, mm -hmm. not the possibility of what I could have. You know, this is not the $10 billion sitting in a bank that makes me feel like I'm rich, but I'm actually living in a totally impoverished life. Yeah. This is the actual day-to-day -day life of meaningfulness and, and, and purpose that I actually have, quality. And so... Um, I would say that's at the essence of the notion of civium. Mm. And then I, I spent a great deal of time thinking about, well, how does that show up in terms of design? Like, how do you think about how the bioregion speaks to the architecture and materials and design of the place so that the, the literally as a kid, you know, you're a brick wall. As a kid, I used to lick the walls because I liked the taste of the dirt. And I liked the fact that if I grew up around the hill country and there was limestone over there, that limestone is the same limestone in my wall, in my house, is the same limestone as in the ground. There's something about that that appeals to me. You're a weird kid. I'm a very weird <laughs> kid, dude. I was crazy, dude, weird kid. And still, I've gotten weirder, just <laughs> less obviously. Um, but there's something I think extremely yeah. critical about saying, hey, if you sure. live in the Pacific Northwest, there's a certain vibe in how we build our place, which is not the same as Sedona, different situation. Right. Um, in certain places, there's different kinds of food, different sources of energy, like all those kinds of characteristics. That's also part of the construct. What's the economic model? How do we actually deal with this thing called money, which is very tricky? 
So that's all other stuff that was done in there, like thinking about what this looks like as we shift through. But that's the essence of it. That's so important. what? So what comes to mind to me is like, imagine you're living in a, in a building. You buy a, you buy an apartment in a building, and the building has I don't know a fucking thousand people in it. Mm-hmm. Big building. I'm talking big city, big building, big apartment complex type of thing. It's it doesn't seem like it's going to necessarily easily be emergent from that building because the civium is a is a level of consciousness as well as a location the location can inform the consciousness but there's so many people who are in places where it's like i don't fucking want to know my neighbors like Mm -hmm. there's really nothing there's no value there that i can see these are not the people that i want to talk to and so you know one thing that comes to mind is like um Burning Man for me was a very interesting, very interesting experiment because there was a common ethos that I hadn't seen in any other festivals. And I was a, I was a festival goer. I went to all the electronic festivals. I got to be okay. buddies with Skrillex when, you know, he was kind of coming up and we go to these shows and the place is just destroyed, just littered with trash. Nobody gives a shit about anything. Everybody is focused in this shared you know, kind of communitas ecstasis that yeah. comes from the ecstasy of the crowd you know, and the ecstasy of the music. So there was some kind of common bond there, but people are still jostling to the front and still it's like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it didn't really land in, in this way. But Burning Man, I started to see something different where people would just give gifts without even needing recognition. You know, the field of money buys you some privilege that some other thing can't get you. Like it started to change the kind of dynamics in a, in a certain way, even though it certainly did cost a lot of money to go to Burning Man, I'm not saying that. But there was a shared ethos and a way in which the synchronicity machine could work. I met my wife there, for example, right? Mm. And I don't know if I would have met my wife if it wasn't for Burning Man. We were both drawn there. And then that took some years to unfold. But I've met some amazing allies and friends at this particular place, which is just, you know, silicone flats. There's just nothing there. But we ga- we gathered there and we built something there together and we shared something there together. And... So it was like a mini temporary civium kind of experience. Yeah, very much so. And I've see, I saw it, and one of the reasons I'm not going this year is I saw last year, I saw some of that start to degrade into the win lose metrics that you would see in a normal, mm, you know, in festival. a normal festival. Yeah. And and while there was still some really beautiful aspects of it, I was like, ah, it's just not quite right. And then it also compelled me to be like all right, well, if I'm not quite happy with what I'm seeing there, you know, in this experience, even though I still love it, and I'm not saying I'm never going back, because obviously it's one of the most magical places I've ever experienced. And, and I still have deep, deep love for, for Burning Man for what it was and what it is, and also a calling and saying like, there's more, like, don't get trapped. I know the money is big now, and there's politics amongst the larger cars and camps, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening. I'm like, yo, watch out, you know, like this is starting to become more like anything else that we've already seen rather than this radically new thing. So I was like, all right, well, I want to create my own little civium, call it Arcadia, which is kind of named after, of course, an old city in Greece and also a mythic idea Mm -hmm. of this second post-tragic Edenic kind of concept. And we call it Festival of a More Beautiful World. And we bring speakers there and we bring you know, an intentional ethos. It's not quite the same. It's in an urban environment. So, but still we're creating like an ethos and a shared like ability for people to come together to temporarily experience it. And what we saw in the first year was it was very successful in that just from one, just from one scene alone, which is the festival closes. And it was this this really beautiful, powerful experience for people. And I give the closing speech and I say goodbye, everybody. And instead of everybody leaving, they all come together in this spiraling, swirling circle where they're all holding each other's shoulders. And they're all like, they're all like cheering and chanting and oming together. And like, that wasn't prompted. Mm. It was just this experience of like, Mm. we were together for this one time we were together. And now we'll all go back to our separate areas and places. And so I think it's a, to, for me, it seems like a combination of a variety of things, finding that in the digital, finding temporary, you know, organizations and places that people can go where you can experience something different. You can experience this willingness to share and support each other and, and change your normal mindset and step into an alternate reality. And then also, you know, finding 
places, communities that you can kind of move to and, and locate with and know your neighbors and know your know who's around you and give a shit. Or if even if you're in the existing place, you'll probably be surprised at how cool your neighbors actually are. Right, right. If you actually try. Yeah, my sense of it is something like you're going to die. <laughs> Life is very short. Yeah. And you shouldn't be wasting any of it. Like it's really, really a bad idea to waste any of your life. It's hard to convey how bad an idea it is yeah. to waste your I life. I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's the real fundamental regret at the end. It's like, oh, fuck, I had this whole chance to live and I didn't do it. And that's that. Damn. Yeah, no, no respawn in this game. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, and many people have this experience. Like they go to Burning Man and they have the experience. And they're like, wow, holy smokes, life actually has qualities of experience that are possible. Then they go back to their apartment where they don't have any relationship with their neighbor and they notice what they were missing. Mm -hmm. And Or they go to their park and there's just trash everywhere. And there's just trash everywhere. Or they go to the beach they, and there's They stuck. say hi to somebody in the park and that person like looks at them squirrely and then, you know, yeah, yeah. that ain't good. So, okay. Obviously, again, we're, we're no, actually meaning step back. I've used this phrase, 10,000 year catastrophe. I just sort of arbitrarily pick a number back in the day. That's where we are, man. We live in a 10,000 years of shit being really out of whack. Mm -hmm. right? We've had famines. We've had pestilence. We've had war on top of war on top of war. We've had people just fleeing the place they're at to go random into some other place, finding out other people are already there and taking it from them. Mm -hmm. right? We've got all kinds of shit. And it's deeply woven in to our bodies, to our cultures, to our minds. Right? It's no surprise that shit is not working out fluidly and elegantly in every location. And it's not, it's not a... Not a surprise to me that that's how things are. All right, fair enough. Uh, which means that you're going to be where you're going to be. If you're living in that apartment in New York and you don't know any of your neighbors, your neighbors have no interest in being with you, I can tell you why that is. And that's where you are. Okay. But when you have that experience, this guy's just a burning man, and you feel dropped into the, to the what is light? What, what is, by the way, it's not a transcendent thing. That's ordinary life. Burning man is, is true power. That's, the, that's yeah, the ordinary yeah. life that is just the way it should be. Yeah. All right. Where you live right now is a far distance from that, surrounded mm -hmm. by false power and false symbols in every direction. If you have a commitment to integrity, which is to say you simply have a commitment to live the life that you truly yearn for, honestly and earnestly, then you're going to have real trouble continuing to stay in that apartment. It's true. You may be stuck there for a long time. It may be a 30-year thing. By the way, it may be multi-generational. You may have to do the thing that you recall your grandparents and great grandparents talking about where you just put your ass to work to save enough dough so that your grandchildren have a chance to live the life that your heart yearns for. Fair enough. Right? And we're, we're not going to undo this thing in a, in a Tuesday. Nonetheless, there's a big difference between contributing to the problem and contributing to the solution uh -huh. at an individual and a collective level. So contribute to the solution. Yearn yeah. for an ordinary human life, right? The thing that is our our gift, right? Our, the beneficence, the benevolence of, of, of what it means to be a human in the world. And then to the degree to which you can, make choices that are in alignment with that. If it's participating in Fit for Life. Fit for Service. Fit for Service. Then, by the way, great name. Absolutely. Then begin. And you can do that virtually. Yeah. Right? And you can be called to get and have gatherings. And you can find something closer to a proper vocation. And maybe you can move to a similarly priced, slightly different apartment where you feel the vibe is a little bit more aligned, or you just meet somebody and have a conversation. You go to a church, you go to an AA meeting, you go someplace with somebody who's connecting with you on a human level and you begin the process. And it's going to be a journey. Um, it's interesting. I think back to, so my parents, I grew up in Southern California and there was a just general cultural zeitgeist in Southern California, which there was really no, the field of value in Southern California was just different than the field of value in Austin, Texas. Mm. And my parents felt that. They felt that in, I had three older stepbrothers and they all went to high school and they all went to high school in Southern California. And I was going to, you know, for middle school, I went to public, you know, public elementary and then middle school moved to private school. And so we got a kind of sense of what the private school vibe was like. And through my brothers, we got a sense that my parents got a sense of what the public school vibe was like. And they're like, ah, this just doesn't feel right for Aubrey. Like, it just doesn't feel like we don't want to raise him in either of these environments, either the public school environment which had a really kind of degraded sense of value and a sense of like the way that the kids, the attitude towards parents in general and mm. like this, this, 
And then the private school thing was its own complex dynamic. They're like, that doesn't really feel quite right either. <laughs> And then they were like, all right, we're going to check out Austin, Texas based on a, you know, a friend of the family who'd moved here. And it's like, Austin's just different. And I remember they, you know, I was in the car with them and they were touring, you know, Westlake High at the time and you know, public school here in, in, uh, in Austin. I, I would know it as Austin Westlake. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. And uh, there's a Westlake actually in Southern California too. It's probably lots of Westlake <laughs> all over the place, but Austin Westlake. Um, I don't like using the word Austin and high together because those are our rivals, fucking Austin high, those motherfuckers. Those <laughs> maroons. Not as bad as those buoy bulldogs, but nonetheless, <laughs> I recently had a buoy bulldog on the podcast. We had a good laugh about it, but it was, you know, it was, uh, that's part of it. That's part of the things like you rep your school and you go, and I was a basketball player. So you go to yeah. battle and you have your, you know, you give it everything you got because it matters for that moment, you know, and then everybody forgets and it doesn't matter, but but ultimately they they felt something they were they would go and they'd stop and they'd ask kids like you know kids that were going to school a question like all right well how do i get to the field or how do i get to the gym and they'd be like this way and they would they would just use words like sir or like you know like yes sir over this there was a kind there was a different thing and it yep. just kind of blew their mind because they'd interacted with high school kids in southern california and again this isn't universal but it's just kind of like an ethos that they found here in austin and they're like, we're moving to Austin. And I'm like, no, <laughs> fucking no. I have all my friends, you know? Like I, I was I was really deep in playing this uh, card game called Magic the Gathering. <laughs> I was so deep in it. I had my yeah, whole so magic. I'm not the only nerd in the room. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure not. I had my whole Magic the Gathering crew. And I remember my, my deepest complaint is like, no one's gonna play Magic the Gathering in Austin, Texas. <laughs> but very quickly it was basketball and girls and I didn't care about Ma Magic the Gathering anymore. But uh, but ultimately, they they found a little bit of that thing that caused them to move the whole family yeah. to Austin. And it was, I can honestly say it was the right choice. There was something about Austin in general as a collective, even though there's many communities within Austin. And Westlake certainly had its problems and still has its problems. It's not a perfect place. But they were drawn to something. And then they had, of course, the luxury to be able and the affordance to be able to actually pick up, yep. move, sell their homes in, a, in California, move to Texas, move the whole, move the whole crew. And I've lived here 28 years since, you know, like I think, you know, yo, parents, like, good job. That was the right choice. This mm -hmm. is a fertile environment for me to build my community from. And even though I went to school in, in University of Richmond and I've gone and traveled in many other places, there's still not another city that I choose as like the main home base. And Austin's changed and it's evolved, but there's something about Austin that I think it's drawn a lot of people to Austin recently, well, like lots. <laughs> tons. And I actually welcome it because I think it's, it is drawing a lot of the right people. And sure, it's drawing some of the people who are like the people you're talking about in Kauai are like, this is not your home, right. <laughs> you know, like don't make Austin, not Austin, yeah, you know, right. like Austin and then Austin has this kind of idea about what it, what Austin is. And it's, some people call it weird and some people call it whatever it is, but there's something that we all collectively try to protect here in, uh, here in Austin. And, uh, it's interesting, you know, I'm not the best. I can't claim that I'm the best at going around and meeting my neighbors and my wife doesn't bake cookies. So we're not, you know, we're not doing the old you know, small <laughs> town thing. But um, but the city itself has seemed to be like a a better container for me to grow up and 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 evolve and thrive in, and and I still find that to be the case. So yeah, to your point, you know, there's we have choices to kind of aggregate in places, and then within those places, aggregate in communities within those places, yeah, and then do our best to kind of grow and 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 evolve within yeah. that place now let's even let's just talk about the like the the economic exodus um because this thing this, this, this is going to unfold over time uh not everybody right now has those choices yeah. some people do mm -hmm. and here's what happened um and for the moment i'll just use the the example of a place like uh you know, colorado springs or uh boulder or well, Asheville Boulder. or something, yeah. Well, I'm going to use Boulder for the moment. Oh, no, that's not a good one. Let's go with Aspen, actually, because it's a bad example. So back in the day, back before interstate highways, relatively inexpensive aircraft, and the invention of the ski slope, Aspen was a very inexpensive, kind of shitty mining town. Beautiful, but no economy. 
right? Technology changed things. Suddenly, rich people were like, hey, that's a nice place. I'm going to go ski, and I can fly in, and I can drive up. And so that created a new economic center. Now, of course, it doesn't take that many rich people spending their rich people money to create a local economy that actually has people live there full time. Mm -hmm. The point I'm making is this. If those who can, who can afford for whatever reason, either because their job allows them to be a different location, well, that's pretty much it. Their, their source of resources is not indexed to the location they're at. If they move to a good, wholesome community and don't fuck it up, <laughs> if they understand that they're going there for reasons intrinsic to it and they need to learn from it, right? they need to learn how to incorporate that into themselves and then participate properly with it to help it actually improve in a way that it naturally receives, that increases the energy in the local economy. And our country yeah. has actually gone through, everywhere in the world has gone through a evaporation into the big cities now for more than a century, a century and a half, two centuries. The movement back out into places that are actually, by the way, more affordable and oftentimes vastly more pleasant to actually live in because the neighbors still have neighborliness changes the economic vector. Mm -hmm. That then makes it possible for other people. And if, if I've got somebody who's, uh, let's say, you know, trapped in the suburbs of Southern California, but they'd really like to move to, let's go with Lockhart. Lockhart, that's yeah. great, that's exactly they'd what I was really thinking like about. really like to move to Lockhart. Exactly what I was thinking about. As the economy of Lockhart grows, jobs appear, right? That's what the economy growing means. And so that individual now can get a job in Lockhart and then move to Lockhart and bring themselves and their family with them. So a period of years, decades, generations, the migration back out. Now the hope, and I would even say the mandate, if I have such the authority, is to not fuck it up. Mm -hmm. right? Take lots of care. Let's be very, I think this is the, this is the meaning of intentional community. An intentional community does not mean we all sort of fuck off to a little location with, with uh, you know, uh, yurts in Southern Kauai, have mm -hmm. sex with each other for a few years and then evaporate. <laughs> That's not intentional community. Yes. What I mean is- We've seen, that. We've seen that story. We've seen that one. That's not how it works. Intentional community is just being intentional about how you are in relationship with a real community. And real community means your grandchildren will break bread with their grandchildren. Mm. And think about it multi-generational. Right? And think about it in terms of ordinary life. It's not about the peak experiences, it's about the day-to-day -day experiences and how you take care of those kinds of things. If we're able to operate with intentionality around constituting real community in the places that we go to, and we don't try to bring in bad habits, we don't bring in unconsciousness or narcissism, which of course is endemic in every direction, so we have to be intentional about it, but we do it, then that flow of energy will actually move into a different distribution and everybody else will begin, begin to increasingly be afforded the opportunity to make those movements. Mm -hmm. um, certainly non-trivial, but I have sat in Manhattan and, and looked at it and had the, the vision, a prophetic vision of what happens. I mean, look at this massiveness, like every building here was built by a person. All this was built by human labor. But what happens if people choose to build something different? If the center of our consciousness, the center of our intentionality moves yeah. from this to this, then over in the fullness of time, all those human hands, and there's a lot of them, a lot of hours in the day, and there's a lot of people who are actually not the least bit lazy, who are very hardworking, but their work is being, is being wasted on all kinds of nonsense, are actually putting it into proper place, then we can build this kingdom in its physical form. Yeah. I think about, uh, there's one place that comes to mind, and uh, I, so I flew into Nashville, and then I drove out maybe 45 minutes or an hour mm. and uh to stay with somebody out there and it was beautiful just fucking beautiful trees and streams and water and it was a gorgeous place uh but then we went grocery shopping at the at the grocer and it was some you know national or at least regional chain and i remember i go there and of course you know health has been a huge part of my life and yeah. i've fortunately you know been exposed to better choices, healthier choices for my body regarding totally. seed oils yep. and chemicals and different things like that. So I went to the local grocery store and that was the option. This is where you go to buy food. You know, there was Dairy Queen if you wanted fast food and there was a, you know, McDonald's, I'm sure somewhere around there, Burger King. And then there's a couple other restaurants and I didn't explore all the restaurants, you know, so I'm sure there's, but it, it look, didn't look like there was a lot there that was a place that I could feed myself. So we're going to go to the grocery store. So I remember going to the grocer there in the grocery store and I'm looking around in the nut butter section and I'm looking for almond butter, you know? Cause like if I can get a little sourdough and get some almond butter, 
regardless if I'm staying for five days, you know, at least I'll have something. And I, or I can, you know, kind of fast, eat light. And, yep. and I'm looking for almond butter and grass-fed beef. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, they no grass-fed beef. They didn't understand why I even cared, Yep. first of all. And they're like, I don't know, this is the beef. I was like, mm-hmm, I get it. <laughs> it's beef. I understand. I understand the principle of beef. <laughs> you know, uh, we're, we're we're about to get into a whole consciousness raising uh, exercise. Everybody, just grab a chair, uh, sit yeah, up. Totally. I'm going to describe to you that uh, what you put into your body matters. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, like, fair enough. And then I was like, and then I was like, uh, what about do you guys have almond butter? And at, at this point, I mean, we're talking 2014, 2015. Yeah, I was under the assumption. You're, I mean. Austin was headquarters of Whole Foods. Right? Yeah. So that consciousness had permeated. So even if you're not at Whole Foods, yeah, I get it. You're gonna find almond butter. Yep. You're gonna find almond butter all kinds of fucking places. And I, I remember moving to Southern California in 1997 and had my mind blown that men ate salads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I go to this place and I asked the I asked the clerk. I said, you know, do you guys have any almond butter? And she looks at me. She goes, What's that? <laughs> and I go, well, it's like peanut butter, but it's made from almonds. And they're like, I've never heard of that. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, so to me that, so I guess there was two choices there. You know, one choice is, all right, move to this place, start your own little grocer. Carry it on your shoulders. Carry yeah. it on your shoulders and start to spread the consciousness about food. And for somebody I'm sure that's a project that they were willing to take because of the allure of this magical, truly magical place it was in. But for me, it was a significant deterrent where I was like, well, a place was dope, but I'm not going back there because I can't, I can't feed myself yep. in a way, you know, easily. I mean, of course now with, you can, you know, order online and Amazon can deliver you almond butter and I, you can fucking figure it out for the most part now. But, uh, but it's interesting. It's because like, we're going to have to push out into areas where yep. whether it's food or whether it's religious ideals, fundamentalist ideals, or whether there's homophobia or whether there's racism or whether there's things that you're like, fuck, this place is amazing, but this thing is not quite right. And I think it'll take some, you know, the infinitesimal courage and also this responsibility to say like, no, 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 I'm going to go there. And I will find people who, you know, align with this and this will emerge, you know, but I have to kind of take it on my shoulders to, to hold a different consciousness for this spot, to allow it to be a place where these ideals can kind of flourish. Totally. And, and with humility. So your point about humility, like super well taken, the idea that you're going to be the one that's going to be the only one that's going to hold this consciousness. And it's just, there's this kind of self-righteousness that can come in and set in that, um, all of us have to be vigilant towards, you know, and really understand with deep sensibility and compassion for the community that already exists and not try to shame in my, in this example, shame the person who doesn't know what almond butter is, but actually be like, oh no, it's not with a condescension. Like it's like peanut butter, but with almonds, you fucking idiot, mm -hmm. you know, like that attitude coming into that community, that's not going to work. You have to have like maximum humility. So that point, and again, that was the, one of the first things that you led with, which is really an important concept. So as we move to kind of close here, we've covered a whole variety of different subjects and topics. And what would be your final kind of message if you're just going to give one message, a transmission? Imagine that this broadcast, just this part for the next you know, few minutes comes out and you're able to broadcast this to all the world. And, uh, and what, would you, what would you offer? Hmm. Well, the thing that I was noticing was very much that the sense of a call. Um, time's now. It's time to do it. Yeah. We have everything we need. It's quite evident that something needs to be done. We can't just sit by and hope that the powers that be will take care of us. We have a pretty good sense of how to do it. We definitely have the capability of doing it. And I think it's now time to actually get to doing it. Yeah. That's what I'd, that's what I put there as the coda. Yeah. The preseason's over. Preseason's over. It's game time. It's game time. Yep. Yeah. It's all right to have some butterflies. <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, it's game time. Yeah, indeed. My brother, this has been such a pleasure. Like really, uh, you know, another one of those beautiful 
just from a meta perspective, what podcasts can do, you mm-hmm. know, because maybe we would have got on the phone and maybe we would have had a three hour conversation, but maybe not. But because of this podcast and because of this, this has allowed us to connect in a way, in a level of depth where we know each other now, you know, and we'll always be a phone call away and always, you know, an email away. And we'll always look at that and be like, oh yeah, all right, what's up? <laughs> you know, like, all right. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a, that's a beautiful thing. So I'm just like deeply grateful and, uh, and just it's been a, you know, beautiful experience to be able to share these a uh, couple hours here with you. Yeah. Yeah. Really appreciate the invitation and, um, yeah, it's good to get to know you. Yeah. So if people want to go dive a little deeper into some of your theories and some of the things you've been on a lot of podcasts, where would you, where would you say people can go? And, uh, do you have any projects or anything you want to point people to? I don't have any projects. Um, <laughs> I doubt that, but <laughs> I have, well, I have far too many projects. But uh-huh. I, I think I'm going to get back to writing. So you may be able to look at me on my old medium and or Substack. I'll probably do both for a while. I have a feel like there's like five or six essays that I get the feeling they're going to come out. Um, occasionally I do YouTube videos, conversations like this, and occasionally I get conversations or invitations to be on podcasts and I say yes. Mm-hmm. But to be honest, I try very hard not to have an identity. Mm. And I definitely don't want to have a following. So uh, <laughs> you kind of have to want to. If you want to, you'll be able to find me. Yeah. If you're only ever so lukewarm about it, yeah, there's better people to follow than me. <laughs> you ever going to write a book? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Maybe a book of poetry. Yeah, I love writing. Nice. I love writing poetry. Poetry's yeah. been probably my favorite way to express my art. You mm-hmm. know, I'm not a great musician, but I can I can do a few things with words. Yeah, nice. Yeah. All right, my brother. From one one warrior poet to another. It's been a beautiful show, my man, and, and a beautiful time well spent. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. And we will see you next week. So much love. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.